So what is BIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or BIDS, has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, Seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SIRP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SIRP widget under the Databases tab or type SIRP-P.PIDS.gov.PA. SIRP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERPI, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. All at the same time! SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Ihayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making 
itong bigyan din ng kalagahan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information. Created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SIRP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SIRP widget under the Databases tab or type SIRP-P.PIDS.gov.PA. SIRP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2022, SERPI has more than 60 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. On the enhanced website of SERPI, you can filter your research by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. All at the same time! SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. 
ihayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making ipang bigyan din ng kalagahan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series, where we feature our policy studies and the insights of government policymakers and program implementers, industry experts and practitioners, scholars, and civil society actors. With this webinar series, which we started in 2020, we hope to provide an accessible venue for evidence-based discussion of current and emerging development issues. I'm Sheila C.R., and I will be your moderator. For our webinar this afternoon, we are featuring an award-winning PIDS book that evaluated the country's irrigation development program and a study conducted by an award-winning economist from PIDS that assessed the impacts of the 2014 amendment to the expanded Senior Citizens Act. To start our conversation, may I call on our president, Dr. Aniceto Arbeta Jr. to open our virtual event, sir. Thank you, Sheila. Good afternoon. Allow me to acknowledge the presence of the following uh, who choose to be with us this afternoon. Uh, from the government, we have the Department of Budget and Management Director, Elena Regina Brillantes, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas Monetary Board Member, Bruce Tolentino, Civil Service Commission Director, Farida Aurelia, National 
Irrigation Administration Employees Association of the Philippines President Edgar Eduardo Yu. From the PIDS, uh, we have uh, our BOT members, uh, Gilberto Lianto. Uh, from the academy, let me acknowledge the following. You have the University of Visayas Executive Director, Victorina Sousa, Central Philippine University Director, Dim Castigador. From the CSOs, NGOs, INGOs, we have uh, Barcelona Heritage and Development Council Chief Executive Officer, Henry Stipona, San Juan Medical Society President Alexandria Bayoa, uh, Lorma Community Development Foundation Incorporated Executive Director Andrew Cesar Mando, Meticulously Justified Delivering Service to Humanity Incorporated Executive Director Juan Paulo Rodriguez, Masagana Sakahan Incorporated Director Daniel Agustin. We greet also our friends from the media. And finally, let me greet our guest colleagues from the government, academic, civil society, media, private sector, and those through the PIDS and SERPI uh, Facebook pages. Today's webinar is a bit different, uh, different because today we publicly celebrate the two awards, National Academy of Science and Technology, or NAST, uh, bestowed on one of our books and the senior staff members uh, for this year. One is the National uh, NAST's uh, Two Outstanding Young Scientist Award in Economics for Dr. Michael Abrigo, a Senior Research Fellow of the Institute. The other is the two 2022 uh, Outstanding Book Awards for the book edited by another Senior Research Fellow, Dr. Well Briones. We thought uh, there's no better way to celebrate receiving these prestigious awards than presenting this in a public seminar we hold weekly, the platform that has served our policy dissemination function very well during the pandemic, and we also believe in the future as well. Thus, we have a back-to-back -back presentation for our virtual event this afternoon. First is the PIDS book, Revitalizing Philippine Irrigation, System, Philippine Irrigation Systems and Governance Assessment for the 21st Century, which, as I have mentioned, recently received the uh, 2022 Outstanding Book Award from the NAST. We launched this book in 2021, but its key messages are worth revisiting, considering the urgent need to improve the performance of our agricultural sector. An efficient and sustainable irrigation system is key to agricultural productivity. The government has implemented several reforms uh, towards this goal, and discusses the in this as discussed in the book, we have an increase in the government's appropriation for irrigation over the years from 8 billion in 2008 to 32.3 billion after 10 years. The latest irrigation related registration passed was the Free Irrigation Service Act or FISA of 2018, which exempts farmers who own eight hectares of land or less from paying irrigation service fees for water derived from the national and communal, communal irrigation systems. While the passage of FISA demonstrates the government's commitment of supporting our farmers by relieving them from paying irrigation service fees, it's not a panacea for all ills besieging the country's irrigation system. For one, uh, the book chapters uh, on FISA noted that the, while the beneficiaries of the free irrigation are poorer than the average, a large majority of them are non-poor. While uh, we hear uh, from uh, Dr. Royal Briones, our agricultural, ec agricultural economics expert at, at the Institute and the book's editor and co-author on the other issues that he and his co-investigators showed when they conducted the comprehensive evaluation of the country's irrigation sector. Dr. Briones will present the volume's key findings and policy recommendations, which hopefully will be useful to our agriculture department and its attached agencies in crafting reforms towards cost-effective irrigation sector development. Meanwhile, Engineer Cesar Solai, Deputy Administrator for Engineering and Operations of the National Irrigation Administration, will give us his office response to the key policies highlighted by the book and update, updates of NIA to address the issues in the irrigation sector. We thank the NIA for accepting our invitation. Moreover, uh, our virtual forum this afternoon also features the study as mentioned that ex uh, expanding health 
Insurance for the Early of the Philippines, authored by PID Senior Research Fellow and uh, the 2022 NAS Outstanding Young Scientist in Economics uh, Award, Dr. Mar uh, Michael Abrigo. This is highly relevant study considering our increasing aging population. Based on the 2015 census and housing, there is there are around 7.5 million seniors aged 60 and above. The Philippine Statistics Office projected that this number will increase to 11.4% in 2030 and 15.9% in 2045. Meanwhile, uh, the uh, 2017 report of the United Nations projected the Philippines' elderly population to grow to almost 15 million by 2050. Considering their important role, uh, their important role in society, we must ensure that our senior citizens are well taken care of. Besides being less economically act active than the younger age groups, they are more susceptible to various medical diseases and comorbidities. The paper by Dr. Abrigo uh, evaluates how the 2014 amendment to the expanded Senior Citizens Act affected insurance coverage and to what extent. In addition, it looked at the groups who have gained from the policy reform and how it affected the medical expenditures and utilization. To react to the presentation of Dr. Abrigo uh, and provide well health insights is Dr. Gilberto de Guzman, he, head of the Philippine Cares Management Office, PhilHealth Cares Management Office. We are honored to have uh, that PhilHealth has accepted our invitation. I wish to thank our presenters from PIDS, Dr. Royal Briones and Dr. Miguel Abrigo for taking time to present their uh, knowledge in outputs and to our discussions, Engineer Cesar Sulaik of EMEA and Dr. Gilberto de Guzman of PhilHealth for giving uh, importance to our virtual event. To our attendees, we appreciate your presence and continued participation in our webinars. I now give up the floor to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Arbeta. Before I call our first uh, speaker, allow me to remind you of our guidelines to join the discussion. So you may post your questions and comments using the Q&A button. I repeat, please use the Q&A button. Please indicate your name and organization if you'd like to be identified when I read out the questions. To all the presenters and discussants, you may respond by typing your answers, which will be visible to all attendees. Alternatively, you can choose to answer the question live during the open forum. For our live stream viewers on Facebook, we highly encourage you to participate as well. Please use the comment section of Facebook for your questions. We will accommodate as many questions as possible that are relevant to the discussion during the open forum. So let us begin our conversation by listening to Dr. Ruel Briones as he presents the highlights of the PIDS book titled Revitalizing Philippine Irrigation, a Systems and Governance Assessment for the 21st Century, which as mentioned by Dr. Arbeta, bagged the 2022 Outstanding Book Award from the National Academy of Science and Technology. The authors of the book are flashed on the screen and the volume editor, Dr. Briones, who is a uh, who is our presenter, is a senior research fellow at PIDS, specializing in agricultural policy. He has published numerous articles and has edited five books on various topics in agriculture and rural development. He has a PhD in economics from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and did a post um, and did a postdoctoral fellowship at World Fish Center in Penang, Malaysia. Dr. Briones, you now have the virtual floor. Thank you, Sheila. I hope everybody can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen, but it should be on PowerPoint uh, mode. All right. Okay. So um, I think uh, Dr. Arbeta already started mentioning uh, some of the issues uh, mentioned in the book. There are actually a whole gamut of issues that were discussed because, yeah, it required a book-length treatment. But we will not be able to focus on any one of those issues, but rather this presentation uh, aims to provide a broad strokes uh, presentation of all of the contents of the book. First of all, why did we write it? No? We called it a revitalized irrigation program in the title, and that's no coincidence, because if you look at the trend in irrigation, 
There was a heyday way back in the 1970s, uh, the martial law years, where the investment, so this is the public investment in irrigation chart. Uh, this is all translated uh, inflation corrected prices, no? So there was this heyday here. But then there was after, from the 1980s onwards, when the Philippines started uh, experiencing massive fiscal crisis, there was this collapse all the way up to the early 2000s. The resurgence happens from 2005 onwards. And so we're interested in seeing whether all of the billions that have been invested, accumulated since 2005, uh, what, uh, what impact has that had on our irrigation sector? Now, you might wonder why there was this resurgence in investment. Well, there was a world food price crisis in 2008. And that's an interesting point because right now, there's again a discussion of a current uh, food price crisis, uh, including fuel crisis and even fertilizer crisis. The resurgence also came uh, when the Philippines' economic growth was gathering momentum. And that means there is now widening fiscal space. So if there was narrowing fiscal space in the early 80s that led to the collapse of irrigation investment, then when there was an expansion in fiscal space, then we can uh, probably justify the expansion also as well in irrigation investment. Because of the renewed government commitment now towards finally completing the task of irrigation. So the country, of course, has a fixed land area. And out of that fixed land area, there is a more or less fixed uh, area that has been targeted as having high potential for irrigation. Based on the current performance, uh, about the time that we started this study, say 2015, the ratio of the potential of the actual to the potential area was about 57%. By 2022, this year, the target is to reach 65% uh, of potential. All of this was happening under the backdrop of irrigation, so a major policy change in the sector aside from increasing investment. On the demand side, the man is waiving irrigation service fees, um, for, especially for national and even communal systems under the act that Dr. Urbeta already mentioned. So given that resurgence, the idea now is that we should do a stock taking, and that's the whole objective of this book. Given all of these expenditures, can we compare it to the benefits received, both the farmers and the economy at large? And in doing this stock taking, we actually looked at, we looked at the cross section of national and communal irrigation systems. National systems, the large ones were uh, all visited by the study team. So you saw a wide range of authors. Uh, we are multidisciplinary. We had, uh, economists uh, from the social sciences, others from the social sciences, as well as uh, engineers, no? uh, agricultural engineers specializing in uh, uh, water resources and irrigation. So of course, communal irrigation systems, difficult to find a representative sample of that, but we did visit numerous ones uh, in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. So there's an actual structure to the selection of these systems, but I don't have time to provide in detail the methodology for this, please refer to the book, which is freely downloadable from the PIDS website. And this book is actually a culmination of a series of studies. So this was not the first and only time that we did this study. Since 2012, once we noticed that there was this revitalization of the irrigation program, we thought that we should uh, conduct an evaluation. Now it's a vast topic, so we thought that we should structure it around the project cycle. So we structured our assessment, even our recommendations, starting from the planning and the design phase, to the implementation phase, to the actual operations phase, and after operations, monitoring and evaluation phase. We looked at the performance, design, management, and governance, and whole gamut of issues. And we claim that it is a state-of-the-art assessment using the most current uh, knowledge, at least at the time the book was uh, formulated uh, in the field of uh, irrigation sector assessment. So we covered, these are uh, the chapters of the book, uh, an overview chapter, then the types of irrigation systems, national and communal, so chapters two and three, then broad view of water resources uh, in chapter four, irrigation water governance, chapter five, assessment of the Free Irrigation Service Act, uh, specific chapter, 
a benefit cost analysis, and a synthesis assessment, Chapter 8. So this, the material from this for this presentation is drawn from mostly from Chapter 8. Now, as a caveat, as I present the key findings and recommendations, uh, you might be wondering, uh, a lot of them are pretty critical. And no doubt, any large scaling of a, a project like this uh, will, will have critical sounding recommendations because we'll be noticing uh, uh, certain areas for improvement. And we should commend the National Irrigation uh, Administration because they were very helpful to us. Uh, they were the ones who provided support, uh, extensive support. Uh, uh, when we did our field work, we relied very heavily on the cooperation from focus group meetings and key informant discussions, including with the irrigators associations, which were themselves mostly organized by the NIA. So, uh, we we are we would rather uh, approach this from a constructive perspective in terms of improving further uh, investments in the sector going forward. So we say I said that we will cover this in terms of the various stages. We start with project identification. Off the bat, we noticed that there was an element uh, of um, being sort of rushed in terms of resources and time for project preparation, no? There was also um, lack of consultative process in the project design, so that later when there was an uh, operations and maintenance phase, they had little operational flexibility because of the need, the need of that phase was not properly reflected, no? In, in the, uh, the design phase. Now, one reason why there was a uh, possible lacking of project preparation is that there was uh, a diminution of in-house capability for science-based project design. So what happened is, actually, the, the explanation, maybe it's also explained in later slides, but I'll explain it now. The Institution of uh, Irrigation uh, Governance and Investment, which is housed in National Irrigation Administration, it also actually experienced that, that decline in investment. So there was a rationalization that had happened all the way up to the early 2000s. However, when there was a decision to do a resurgence, the, the, uh, the administration had already been downsized. So a lot of the expertise had already been lost because of um, there was an anticipation that the whole irrigation sector would actually be um, either devolved to local government and or uh, to uh, water users, namely the farmers themselves. But there was a recentralization effort, as it were, because of this massive uh, investment uh, program since 2008 onwards. Hence, you know, the, the, the human resources fell behind the uh, expenditure resources for the funding. There was also noticeably a uh, lack of coordination of roles with other agencies and even local government units. Note that local government units are supposed to have jurisdiction over uh, uh, small-scale irrigation systems. This is under the Agriculture and Fisheries Modernization Act of 1998. But in practice, it's still largely handled uh, and supported by the NIA. Uh, the NIA has been housed uh, since uh, around mid-2015 or so, certain time, uh, under the office of the president rather than away from its uh, previous home in the Department of Agriculture. So there was now a disjoint this joint uh, planning and targeting and prioritization between the DA and the NIA henceforth. One reason why coordination is difficult is that there are at least 13 agencies mentioned no, that are somehow involved, whether centrally or peripherally, or with an important aspect of irrigation planning, design, appraisal, spread across various agencies, Office of the President, uh, Department of Environment and Natural Resources, Department of Agrarian Reform, and of course, Department of Agriculture. So there are partnership mechanisms and interagency committees, but based on our FGDs and uh, uh, informant interviews, they are not been uh, sufficient to address the coordination failures. From the design phase, now we move to the implementation phase, which is mostly by procurement, okay? So uh, there, there is, it's not that common that we do a force account or in-house uh, production of irrigation facilities. However, even the procurement phase, when we contract it out, there is often uh, 
There is sometimes a failure of bidding, which is a source of implementation delay. There have been also noted delays in budget releases. So of course, we have this perennial debate between the agency and the DPM, uh, who is at fault, why the budget has not been released. DBM will say that uh, the legal requirements for the release were not uh, fulfilled. The agency said we fulfilled, but uh, the money is still not there. But whoever is at fault, it turns out that uh, these uh, delays in the disbursement tend to also delay the actual implementation and construction. Now, in fairness, farmers interviewed for the study reported. So we went through a number of uh, irrigators association, both national and communal systems. They actually said they have very little to complain about in terms of uh, implementation. So from their perspective, mukang on time naman daw you implementation of project. So maybe the reports about delays uh, are uh, further upstream, say from the viewpoint of the foreign donor, for instance, that happened to fund the projects. So, but from the viewpoint of the IAs, from the even from the organization phase to the actual construction and turning over, they were largely satisfied. Moving on from implementation to operations and maintenance. Uh, so, Jan, uh, here we saw a lot. Of, we, here we have a lot of observations. Our engineers encountered a lot of observations. No? Uh, they found increasing. So there was degradation. So remember, we started from 2012. And in fact, there was increasing degradation and poor system performance across various scales. So whether we talk about the largest systems down to the smallest communal systems and the in-between reservoir systems, we have this uh, evidence of, uh, or observation of degradation and poor system performance. What do we mean by this? For instance, control structures that are in need of rehabilitation and improvements. So sluice gates that actually could no longer move and then they're permanently up or permanently down position. No? Uh, canals that had been filled up with silt, so are in need of desilting. Uh, embankments that had uh, collapsed and are in need of reshaping or heightening. Now, when we try to trace why we had these so many observations, it turns out perhaps one of the root causes is lack of funds to do proper operations and maintenance. So what happens is all of these uh, problems tend to accumulate because there was not enough uh, uh, resource allocation towards operations and maintenance. What happens is once the system has deteriorated sufficiently or there is a large typhoon uh, and then the, the, the deterioration uh, even is aggravated with this natural disaster, then we do an, a rehabilitation to arrest, if not slow down, the further deterioration. Now, there used to be an automatic source of funding uh, for operations and maintenance because the farmers themselves, there was a cost recovery scheme called the irrigation service fee. But this has been removed and this has been replaced by a national government subsidy, which is uh, kind of fixed. I believe it's uh, currently at 7 billion uh, per year, covering everything. No? Uh, please, uh, the NIA discussant could, could please uh, update us, no? engineer, uh, later. So we noticed that because of this, uh, we no longer uh, require farmers to do uh, to contribute to uh, the operations and maintenance. This seems to have placed the irrigation management transfer scheme in jeopardy. So we were in the middle of turning over actually these systems, including national systems, to varying extent to user associations, the, the irrigators associations. But since they have the, the incentive for them to do so has been sort of uh, taken out because they are no longer required to contribute to the upkeep of these systems. So one consequence that we can see in terms of the numbers is that despite huge investments, uh, the expansion of the area, of the new area, seems to be really, really slow, okay? So for instance, for 2010 to uh, 2016, we noticed that. And when we try to break, when we tried to break down the profile of actual projects being funded, it turns out that in that time span where there was already this multi tens of billions of peso annual investment, 67% of the expenditure actually went to projects which were not new. So rehabilitation projects or restoration projects. Only 33% were directed to new or mostly new projects. 
So if we're wondering why the expansion in new areas has been very slow, it's because the those vast uh, expenses were actually not mostly not devoted, at least up to 2016, no, to uh, expanding new areas. So sometimes in Senate hearings we we hear that oh, we, we you know the senators complain uh, that uh, you know maglalaan kami ng so much funds for. Uh, for uh, irrigation, but then we read the NIA reports only a small expansion of new area. Well, that's one of the explanations. So what's been happening is, uh, why is there such a huge investment, almost 70% going to uh, rehabilitation or restoration? It's because the one that I mentioned in the previous slide, that there has been underfunding of the O&M, uh, underestimation of the funding requirements of the O&M, and therefore the problems accumulate and then in one shot, uh, a project is packaged to try to rehabilitate or restore the system. So from the, um, from the uh, uh, ME, uh, sorry, O&M, now we move to the monitoring and evaluation phase. So systems management, so it's now in this phase of this systems management. Now there's a, also the management task of monitoring and evaluating you know, the, the operations of those systems. However, that phase, the systems management, currently generates insufficient data for proper monitoring. For instance, key parameters such as water flow were not being monitored. So not, uh, so of course, major, big, major systems, they are being monitored, but there are many uh, medium to smaller scale systems where the data uh, is not updated or is not being collected. So aside from quantity of water per unit time or water flow, there's also a, a, an absence of monitoring of water quality. So uh, the national, the, our review of national irrigation systems also conducted a water quality uh, analysis. And we found that there are grave concerns uh, or serious, maybe not grave, no, serious concerns about water quality. Usually traceable to illegal dumping from the communities that live around, in and around the irrigation systems. Uh, so illegal dumping of solid waste. There are also in selected systems, salt water intrusion problems. And this can adversely affect the health of farming systems, the uh, systems that are being uh, irrigated, as well as even the surrounding community, you know, because uh, the canals become uh, a means of uh, transmitting noxious, uh, noxious substances and even pathogens, depending on uh, the degree of, uh, uh, of quality, of uh, the deterioration in the quality of the uh, water in the system. So, those are all of our observations. Let me devote uh, the last few minutes of this presentation to our recommendations. So, we, we noted that uh, human resources had been lacking for uh, actually policy-related reasons, uh, <laughs> especially within NIA. Unfortunately, uh, all of the irrigation investment was not really channeled towards uh, restoring the previous level of human resource capacity. So what we recommend is, have to admit that we need a lot of human resources for project implementation. So uh, we hear right now that the new administration is looking at right sizing, and that's the correct term to use. It's not just taking people out, but sometimes putting new people in with the right competencies because there's not enough current personnel right now to fill up the need you know, that is being created by the expansion of uh, government programs. There's also uh, the need to improve even the human resource capacity of irrigation users, especially if we're continuing to for our push of uh, participatory uh, uh, management of irrigation systems. So definitely even our irrigators associations, for instance, our water masters, uh, might actually be delegated you know, to, to those uh, systems. But def definitely that kind of task uh, will, will require uh, a little bit uh, better uh, set of skills uh, for, for our farmer organizations. There should be an increased coordination uh, with between the irrigators, so, so the DENIA itself, and the Department of Agriculture. So we can, we can uh, actually say, Bring, bring the, the NIA back to the DA, as well as with the local government units. Kasi ang local government units, yun din naman ang unang takbuhan uh, ng mga farmers, no? Uh, and in the, we're not saying na LGUs do not help at all. We've encountered uh, instances in the field na 
Nakakatulong naman, papahiram ng bako para mag-do sa maintenance. Pero significant works, uh, we have not been actually able to see that unless uh, the funding came from outside uh, the LGU itself. So let's say we have a foreign-assisted project that happened to be in that LGU that supported irrigation. That's where we see uh, strong involvement of the LGU. So in terms of internal financial resources, talagang kapos sila. So, better coordination among the various institutions engaged in governing water resources, so including the DNR, uh, the DAR, for instance, uh, because they're the ones uh, who provide a lot of uh, program beneficiary development for agrarian reform areas, as, as well as, of course, the DA for all other areas. When we do estimates of what is the, poten the real potential, <coughs> excuse me, the real potential area, <coughs> In selected systems, we notice some overestimation. So later on, when we try to report the other parameters like uh, service area to uh, design area, because it could have been the overestimated design area. Because uh, it turns out that some of the land that was being projected for use of irrigation has been converted already uh, by the time the irrigation is already online and operating. So these have to be anticipated, no? especially since a lot of these systems uh, uh, in, in Central Luzon and Calabar Zone uh, are in areas that have been uh, either converted to residential or industrial uses. So um, also consider uh, if, if the availability of water for a particular irrigation system might have been overestimated given the, the integrity or the state of uh, forest cum water resources of the near of the watershed supporting uh, that that irrigation system, so issues of water availability as well as other georeference data. So one of the charts uh, or maps developed in the study was to show that uh, there was a, a map on soil erosion uh, versus the map of the watershed area showed that there was high erosion rate in the projected, uh, in, in the, uh, the, the, the watershed area supposedly for the system, which means if it's eroded, there was probably lack of vegetative cover already in that, uh, uh, in that uh, target, uh, in that uh, watershed. So there was probably uh, insufficient coordination with the Department of uh, Environment and Natural Resources, which is the jurisdiction naman over the management of forest resources. So yung mga ganong issues of coordination need to be um, uh, really uh, addressed. When uh, in the project appraisal stage, there should be rigorous benefit-cost analysis. So if, if we know that there is a typical tendency to overestimate the area uh, over time or underestimate the cost, uh, this should be already uh, uh, anticipated so that, you know, we don't invest the money uh, to, to, to um, areas where potentially the irrigation project is not actually worthwhile and deprive other areas and other communities where the, the irrigation investment makes sense, but somehow kinulang sila, kinapos sila ang investment. So important to make really rigorous benefit cost analysis down to the project level. So if there's a need to adjust the physical target, maybe our physical target is too ambitious. No? Uh, we, we don't have enough uh, irrigation area within the given time frame and the need for doing feasibility studies. Then pues, we, let's, let's adjust the physical target, right? It's better to, rather than rush to complete so-called task of covering the entire potential area, we end up um, overspending in some areas and underspending in other areas. No? The system's design needs to be improved by incorporating terrain features, water availability, operational flexibility, user participation, and even crop diversification away from rice. So we noted in the field some tendency. I'm sure uh, Nia is already veering away from this. No? But in, during the time that uh, we were conducting the study, there was a strong and heavy bias towards uh, irrigation systems, towards flooded, no? Uh, 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 flooded agriculture that is common in rice growing. But other designs might be more useful in other areas such as sugarcane areas, corn growing areas. So the, the, the engineering is somewhat different. So 
uh, if we allow for greater user participation in inputs from users, there might be a more flexible designing of, um, of these systems, allowing for more diversified cropping systems aside from uh, continuous flooded rice agriculture. Especially now, by the way, no, dagdagan ko lang, na we have a Rice Tarification Act that uh, allows more imports uh, in, into the rice sector. And therefore, it also encourages in certain marginal rice areas, especially diversification, to improve the livelihoods of uh, erstwhile rice growing farmers. Now, in many cases, I mentioned a while ago the benefit cost issue. Uh, medyo kakapusin yung justification kung irrigation lang. However, if these facilities are integrated into multi purpose projects like hydropower, which is common in a few large systems. So, or uh, in integrate uh, drainage or flood control or other such you know, multi-purpose projects uh, and, and uh, say potable water supply. Then there is a possibility with these multi-purpose projects to uh, be able to meet those benefit cost uh, ratio uh, standards. No? Procurement and uh, implementation bottlenecks, we need to troubleshoot the process flow and see how we can accelerate this. For operations and maintenance, there should be uh, adoption of what is called asset management method. I think this is now the current best practice now towards the uh, uh, operations and maintenance of irrigation systems, which incorporates financial, economic, social, and engineering considerations towards sustained functionality in a cost-effective way. The ONM funding, which I said has, has been underestimated, taasan na lang siguro natin yung estimation. That's why it's, it's really important that uh, we, we devote enough funding now rather than, you know, wait for the needs to accumulate and hope that there will be uh, isang bagsak no malaking funding for restoration irrigation. Better to have a more even distribution of the funding over time by allocating enough ONM. Integration of water shed management into irrigation system management. There were uh, identified 150 plus, I think, no uh, critical watershed areas uh, under a DA project before. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if there are any updates as to whether uh, those critical watersheds, there's been proper coordination with the appropriate agency like DNR and local governments uh, in terms of uh, improving the state of those critical watersheds. Uh, data collection needs to be improved and deploy, uh, latest information technologies deployed, for instance, parcellary surveys based on GIS so that a, the whole command area can be properly mapped down to the parcel level and the canal level. Uh, towards the adoption of more analytical approaches, I, as I mentioned, geospatial and mapping approaches. Uh, resource assessment of water potential, we, we tried in one of those chapters to uh, provide a demonstration of how uh, a modeling approach, a mathematical modeling and simulation approach might be helpful in uh, irrigation system evaluation and um, and, monitor and uh, uh, future operations. Oh, okay. So uh, that was the whole gamut of, uh, of, of our, our findings. So again, uh, going forward, we know that we will continue uh, to invest heavily in our irrigation, even now more because food suddenly, uh, it's always been top priority, but again, elevated now because of the current five Fs crisis we're undergoing. You know, food, feed, fertilizer, fuel, and finance. No? Uh, hopefully uh, this uh, book will be of renewed relevance uh, under these conditions. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Briones, for that uh, concise but meaty uh, presentation of the uh, main messages and main messages of the book, as well as uh, important uh, recommendations to address the issues that you saw in your comprehensive evaluation of the irrigation sector. So keep those questions coming, friends. And uh, our uh, speaker would, would be most glad to um, address your questions either um, online or uh, live during the open forum. So we invited an official of the National Irrigation Administration or NIA to react to the key points highlighted in the book and give also give NIA's perspectives and insights on the development of the country's irrigation sector. And we are honored to have with us today the Deputy Administrator for Engineering and Operations of NIA, Engineer Zar Zulai, in his nearly 
30 years of public service at NIA, Engineer Zulaik has demonstrated in-depth institutional knowledge and management skills on accelerating the agricultural sector through irrigation development. His hard work and commitment have earned him numerous awards, including Most Outstanding Irrigation Officer at the national and regional levels and Best Irrigation Management Office Manager. Engineer Zulai, the virtual floor is now yours. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon to each and everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. An Aniceto Orbeta Jr. And uh, good afternoon to Dr. Uh, Ruen uh, Briones, uh, thank you for uh, inviting us here in this uh, forum so that uh, we can discuss uh, thoroughly the, uh, the situation of uh, the irrigation here, uh, implemented by the NIA. First, uh, for NIA, the study provided key takeaways to initiate conversation on national programs that can support the acceleration of irrigation development in the country, such as in public investment in irrigation. The budget of the government depends on the priority areas of the current administration. An example is the Build, Build, Build program of the Duterte administration that accelerated the infrastructure project in the government, including irrigation. Hence, the investment in irrigation had been bulletized and would vary by year, which affect the performance of the agency. At present, the budget uh, priority for fiscal year 2023 of the President Bongbong Marcos is highlighting the agriculture sector and food security. With this, the NIA is looking forward to a stronger and increased budgetary support for, this, for the next six years from the government support to fulfill the agency's mandate, new area, development and management of irrigation system for the agriculture sector. As per the National Irrigation Master Plan for 2020 to 2030 for irrigation investment and reference to the National Economic and Development Authority or NEDA, the directions there is a needed to explore public-private partnership or the PPP for irrigation, particularly for multi-purpose project and for diversified cropping system. Involving the private sector investment through PPP will accelerate the irrigation development and other potential benefits other than the irrigation like hydropower and floating solar power generations. The government program will encourage the participation of private sector in its much needed investment to the Philippine agriculture. Next is the consultative process in project design, implementation and operation and maintenance. From the project identification that is initiated by the NIA field offices as identified by project consultant, prospective man par uh, farmers beneficiaries through their local government units with that participatory approach process is adopted in the formulation of project to consider the criteria of feasibility study as recommended in the National Irrigation Master Plan as to technical, institutional, economic and financial and environmental and social aspect. Prospective farmers beneficiaries are consulted and involved in project identification, investigation, evaluation and selection, pre-construction and during construction, eventually operation and maintenance of irrigation system. They are organized into irrigators association or the IAs and trained to be self-reliant and self-governing partners from planning to management of the system. As of December 31, 2021, there are 8,899 irrigators associates entered into O&M contract from the national irrigation system, while the NIS NIP is 6,073 communal irrigation system had been turned over to organize farmers with farmers beneficiaries of 462,868. All projects and programs implemented by the agency have gone through the process as required by oversight agency, which include the endorsement of the NEDA Regional Development Council or the RDC, National Commission on Indigenous People or the NCIP, and the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, DNR. In addition, the Department of Agriculture Regional Management Committee 
RMC meeting which are participated by regional director of all attached agency of the day, including NIA, are conducted quarterly. As a system management committee, SMC's meeting is conducted in the field offices with the IAs and the DA and LGU to sustain the improvement of irrigation system. Degradation of system control structures in needed of rehabilitation improvement canals needing in the silting or reshaping or heightening of embankments. Aside from irregular O&M needs of irrigation system, frequent occurrence of typhoon and calamities contributed to the deterioration of the irrigation system where repair and rehabilitation funds are not provided. The climate change adaptation works or the Chicago program is continuing program since 2013 and presently will also focus on the retrofitting and modernization of the NIS adapting the standard formulated in the Philippine Climate Change Adaptation Project. NIA and the DNR signed a memorandum agreement on August 5, 2019 for the cooperation and responsibility in the management and development of the 143 watershed supporting the national irrigation system in the country. There is also a line on the recommendation in the National Irrigation Master Plan 2020 to 2030 to establish strong coordination with the DNR and its field offices, as well as the LGU in the protection and management of watershed. For the fiscal year 2022, approved budget NIA is formulating plans for rehabilitation and protection of water resources supporting irrigation system nationwide. Relative the modernization of irrigation system, establishment of command centers are being pursued to monitor flood level and enable stakeholders to act in a timely manner and avoid unnecessary loss of lives and properties during calamities. That's that's all, and uh, thank you uh, the, the, for for uh, for us. Uh, this are all the presentation of Mia. Thank you very much, Engineer Salai. Um, we'll we'll hear more from Engineer Salai during the open forum. Okay, so I think uh, okay. Now let us proceed to the second presentation. Okay, so from irrigation, let us jump to social services, particularly to health insurance for our senior citizens. And the study was authored by uh, Dr. Michael Abrigo, uh, Dr. Timothy Halliday, and Dr. Uh, Teresa Molina. Um, you can see a copy of uh, the cover of, of this, uh, the cover page of the study, of, uh, which was released as a PIDS discussion paper, and which you can easily download from our website. And to present the key findings and recommendations is Dr. Michael Abrigo, who is a senior research fellow at PIDS. Dr. Abrigo started as a research analyst at PIDS in 2008 and eventually rose through the ranks, uh, became a research fellow in 2017. His research focused primarily on the welfare implications of demographic change and of human resource policies, although he has also conducted studies on other topics such as on public finance, climate change, and resource economics. He was recently awarded, as mentioned by Dr. Orbeta, the 2022 Outstanding Young Scientist in Economics Award by the National Academy of Science and Technology. Dr. Abrigo, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Sheila, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, I, I, I know I wouldn't get the award without me being at the ATS, but that's a big part uh, of me being a researcher. Um, may I have the slide flash on the screen, please? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, as mentioned by Sheila, this study is uh, is a collaboration with uh, with colleagues from the University of Hawaii, from the Institute of Labor Economics, uh, Tim Halde and Teresa Molina. And this is part of a story of a series of research that I'm doing uh, about um, health in the Philippines, about particularly on social health insurance and how it impacts uh, welfare of people in the Philippines. Uh, next slide, please. So we know that over the last decade, we have given a lot of uh, uh, free stuff, well, 
for for many of our uh, people, for our population. So we've given free health insurance, free education, uh, free pension. And so a big part of that is free health insurance. And part of that story is because we've got these uh, big endowment from the 2012 sin tax law. So makita nyo, uh, after 2012, we got this big bump on primary membership in our field health. And that is largely driven by the number of indirect members, some of yung sponsored members, indigents, uh, senior citizens. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. Part of this is because we want as a society to have health for all. And part of that story is that uh, for the longest time, we've been trying to push down new out-of-pocket health expenditures uh, to go down. So kasama yan dun sa ating uh, Phil Health Law, uh, National Health Insurance Law in 1995 and eventually uh, when it was uh, updated. So with the end view of quality assurance, increased benefits and reduced out-of-pocket expenditure. So usually ganito yung uh, tenor ng discussion when we talk about social health insurance and why we need Phil Health uh, in our lives as Filipinos. Uh, next slide. Uh, and for the most part, uh, we did several studies on how this has impacted uh, some parts of our population. So in 2019, we have another study looking at how for peace, and because of when you're for peace, automatically covered Korean on field health, uh, ano yung impact nun sa um, access to healthcare and dun sa health expenditures ng mga bata, mga may hirap na bata. And what we found is that uh, to induce treater hospital visits for both preventive and curative care, uh, and one of that uh, one of that uh, impact that we estimated is that uh, yung isang mahirap na bata na mayroong sakit, pag meron siyang insurance kasi meron siyang four piece, um, mas malaki yung chance niya na pumunta pagpakita sa hospital sa isang healthcare practitioner by 25 percentage points. That's quite big. And another part of the story is that uh, kung meron kang field health, lowest out of pocket health expenditures among poor children. So we've documented that. Uh, and the other part of the story, so mula bata, yung mga matatanda naman. Next slide. So yung around 2010, 2013, uh, nilibre natin yung mga kasama doon yung mga, mga batang may hirap. Uh, but in 2010, ginawa rin natin yun for the elderly. So we granted additional benefit to senior citizens, including mandatory flood coverage, to all indigent senior citizens. Indigents lang. May hirap lang mga senior citizens in 2010. But eventually in 2014, uh, kinover na niya lahat ng senior citizens. In 2010, uh, medyo hindi hindi pa siya ganun nag-expand uh, and part of part of that is maybe because this is funded by the LGUs so kung may pera LGUs they can fund uh, spon they can sponsor the field health uh, coverage of senior citizens but in 2014 after the sin tax law uh, yung pang mga hindi kasama wala pang field health na senior citizens uh, they were covered uh, through sin through ano uh, through taxes that were uh, generated from sin tax law Next slide, please. Uh, so, so, why is it important to 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 look at uh, senior citizens and how they got a field? Well, one part is that uh, on on the one hand, we want everyone to have access to healthcare and having health insurance uh, facilities that access to healthcare. But then, on the other hand, the Philippines is aging, as mentioned by Dr. Arbeta earlier. Uh, so, um, in the next. Uh, Decade, we would be an aging, popula aging population. In another generation, we would be an aging population. And with, uh, and kung prati natin yung libre, kung libre yung uh, health insurance ng mas matatanda, and usually mas, ma mas mahal uh, yung healthcare ng matatanda, uh, then that would mean, uh, papaano natin babayaran? Sinong gubayad niyan? Uh, will there be enough? Pag, marami ng, pag sobra ng marami yung matatanda, will there be enough workers to pay for their uh, health insurance? Uh, but, but sino ba yung matatanda in the first place? So on average, this is based on uh, 2018 Family Income and Salary Survey by the PSA. They are less likely from poor household. They ha usually have higher income expenditure per capita. Bakit? Because they survived into old age. So ibig sabihin nun, kung survive sila into old age, they are usually better endowed when they are younger. So better yung healthcare nila, better yung education nila. And through these periods from, from their working sa, sa prime age nila, ng pagtanda nila, they are able to accumulate wealth, which they are able to use when, when they become senior citizens. 
But then, not all elderly are alike. We know uh, from the literature, from data, that uh, mas malaki yung inequality among older than younger population. So kahit on average, mas mayayaman sila, we have these, uh, pop, these uh, elderly na hindi maganda at hindi, na, mas, hindi nakaka-access ng healthcare services. Next slide, please. This come, dito, dito pumapasok yung study. Uh, we want to answer essentially three simple questions. Una, how did the Expanded Senior Citizens Act affect insurance coverage for elderly Filipinos? Who was impacted by the expansion? And how did insurance coverage affect medical expenditures and utilization? So, simply lang yung mga tanong na gusto namin sa uh, Next question. Uh, next slide. So, kung ito yung last slide na makita nyo uh, for this presentation, ito yung pinaka-importante essentially. What we found was that uh, the Expanded Senior Citizens Act increased social health insurance coverage by 10 to 20 percentage points. That's quite huge. Uh, those who were affected tend to be middle class, family, and in some dimensions, they are high, utili uh, high utilizers, suggesting adverse selection uh, into insurance. And contrary to expectations, sabi natin as a policy, we want to lower out-of-pocket expenditures. But here, what we found was that out-of-pocket medical expenditures increased by over 100%, driven by non-covered uh, expenditure categories, so outpatient services and medicines. And what we found is that the evidence is consistent with outward shift in medical care demand. So, uh, mas intensive yung margin, uh, uh, mas malaki yung intensive margin effects. So, uh, later, I will discuss. Uh, there's also increase in chronic disease diagnosis, and this is consistent with studies elsewhere in other studies. Now, when uh, they provided social health insurance, uh, instead the mobile out of pocket expenditures actually must to much. Okay, so ito na yung details ng study. Next slide, please. So to be able to do yung mga estimation, uh, we we use yung expanded senior citizens act as a natural experiment to study the, the impact of health insurance coverage among the elderly. So we did difference and difference. Uh, we exploit yung characteristics nung, nung, nung batas na, uh, dahil sa batas na to, nung 2014, kung ikaw ay 60 years old and over, meron kang biglang uh, instant coverage ng field health insurance. So, and we use this uh, eligibility as instrumental variable for insurance coverage. The technical details I will not uh, discuss further, but it's uh, available in the published report as shown by Sheila Kanina. Next slide. So, for this, we used uh, representative sample surveys from pre and post ESCA legislation. So, yung annual poverty indicator survey from 2014 and 2020 for 2014-2016, the National Demographic and Health Survey for 2013-2017, both uh, from the, by the Philippine Statistics Authority. Next slide, please. So for first question, um, how, did expanded, how did the Expanded Senior Citizens Act affect insurance coverage for elderly Filipinos? Next slide. So I will show you uh, four panel, two panels, uh, four graphs. Um, first panel, uh, using APIs, the, yung sa right hand would be from the demographic and health survey. Uh, yung sa APIs, we are looking at primary members. Ito yung actually nakaregister dun sa, sa, sa PSA, sa PhilHealth. And then your right, ito yung covered by PhilHealth. So both primary members and their dependents. Medyo magkaiba yung, uh, yung numbers sa gilid kasi mas malaki yung, syempre, yung kasama yung dependents. But what you would see, next slide, is that in 2014, 2013, uh, this is before the Expanded Senior Citizens Act Amendment, uh, yung threshold na 60 years old, yung pro proportion of those who are covered or those who are primary members of PhilHealth, smooth siya. So, para lang siyang, ano, diretso lang siya, wal walang, uh, walang, ang tao dito? Walang uh, bump dun sa dun sa threshold na yun. So as you, pag naglagay ka ng linya dyan, diretso lang siya. But here comes after the the amendment in 2014, 2016 uh, for APIS and 2017 and DHS. Next slide. You would see that a uh, rather small bump uh, at age 60. So from 50, so if you look at yung sa APIS, around 35% uh, of of people who are aged 59 are ano ha, has been, uh, uh, have feel health pero pag ng 60 merong ano may discontinuity tumaas siya by about uh, 10 
10 uh, percentage points. And when our estimation, what we find is about 10 to 20 percent, uh, 20 percentage points, depending uh, on the specification. So, uh, yung expanded single citizens actually increased uh, field health coverage uh, among the population. Uh, next slide, please. So, next question is, who was impacted by the expansion? Sino yung 10, 20 percentage points na ito na increase dun sa field health coverage? Next slide. So this is an important question kasi yung impact estimates namin, yung ano yung epekto niya dun sa mga tao, uh, which will be answered in the next question, uh, refers to, ed to the elderly population who are induced into having insurance coverage because of, S of the Senior Citizens Act. Nagkaroon siya ng field health kasi na-cover siya nung, nung expanded senior, senior Citizens Act. These are what we call the compliers. Uh, but the compliers cannot be identified directly. Hindi mo makita yung tao at sabihin mong complier siya. But what we can do is to have their average characteristics uh, identified uh, based on some technique. And this is important uh, for, from a policy perspective. Kasi ang gusto natin, uh, yung kaya maka-afford ng insurance, they should pay. And those who are not able to cover, uh, we should pay for them. So, so ganun ba yung nangyari? So the idea is that we use the... Uh, Spanish Senior Citizens Act as a natural experiment, so meron tayong pre, post, and we have uh, age eligibility, and this allows us to identify the average characteristics of the always takers. Ito yung mga tao na meron mga Senior Citizens Act na wala, meron silang field health. Yung always takers, ito yung treatment compliers, ito yung sinabi ng compliers kanina na, na walang field health. Then we have the treated compliers, yung nagka-field health, kasi dahil sa Senior Citizens Act, and the never takers, and the never takers. Itong never takers, offeran mo man, uh, na-cover man sila ng Senior Citizens Act, hindi sila, kung wala silang insurance. And this allows us to back up the average characteristics of the compliers. So, kaya natin characterize, sino ba itong mga compliers nito? So, yung details, yung uh, technical details are also available in the published report. So, next slide. So, sino yung mga compliers natin? Ano yung characteristics nila? Next slide. Uh, first, uh, next slide please. Uh, first, they are less likely male. They are more likely female. So, yung mga graphs, ito yung proportion ng male. Itong first uh, column, proportion ng male dun sa data, so, the, who are always takers, compliers, never takers, and then the average. Okay, and as you can see, uh, around 60%, uh, around 60% are female dun sa mga compliers. In the next slide, you would see naman, uh, not they are more likely middle class by education or income uh, or income and wealth. Bakit? Next slide. This is, these results are not uh, surprising. Una, they are more likely female because males are more likely continuously employed during their prime age and therefore they're covered by field health uh, no habang nagtatrabaho sila. And pag, if they provided enough for in, to feel health, uh, they would be part of lifetime membership program. So pag retire nila, they're part of the lifetime membership program. Hindi sila kasama dun sa na induce nung amended senior citizens act. And we know from the data that female labor force participation is only around fifty percent compared with uh, seventy percent plus for males, and that females exit from the labor force usually this is timed with childbearing uh, based on uh, other studies. And females may be covered as dependents uh, even before the senior citizen, expanded Senior Citizens Act, uh, but these are not automatic. Kila mong enroll siya as a dependent, and they're slightly less generous with additional dependents. So, kung mas marami kang dependents, you share sila dun sa benefit ng dependents. So, pag mas marami, mas malit yung benefit. And they are more likely middle class. Bakit? Because yung poor, uh, even before the Senior Citizens Act uh, expansion, the amendment, they're automatically covered through the four piece under field health sponsored programs. Yung namang mayayaman, they are more likely covered through direct contribution, kaya nila magbayad ng field health. And they, eventually, they would eventually graduate to lifetime membership upon retirement. So, uh, yung gusto natin targetin, yung mga walang field health uh, over the course of their lifetime, sila naman yung compliers dito sa ating uh, program. Next slide, please. So, yung ating uh, complier analysis can, can be also used for selection into program. So, uh, this is a big question in, in insurance. Kasi ang gusto natin, uh, lahat nakakukuha ng insurance. Kasi, uh, well, this is the question. Are those who are more likely to use insurance more likely to obtain insurance coverage? Kasi kung ikaw yung 
kung ang, la- kung ang karamihan ng kumukuha ng insurance ay yung may mga sakit at yung cost ng healthcare ay hinahati lang naman sa mga sa mga taong nagbabayad ng insurance, din ibig sabihin pag mas likely na magkaroon ng insurance yung may sakit, tataas yung cost ng insurance eventually. And eventually, uh, sobrang mahal na siya, wala na makakapagbayad ng insurance. So gusto natin, uh, walang adverse selection into insurance. And one way to do that is to have a universal uh, health insurance coverage na lahat magbabayad. Lahat would be able to contribute uh, to that uh, system. So next slide. So we used the same technique to identify meron bang uh, adverse selection dito sa ating social health insurance, sa ating field health. So next slide. Sabi natin yung always takers, they will always have insurance even without the expanded Senior Citizens Act. So yung, yung they're likely na mas mataas yung kanilang health expenditures, mas mataas yung kanilang hospital stay, mas mataas yung kanilang pag-visit uh, sa health facility. Sa so next slide, uh, this group, you always takers and treated compliers, this group has insurance coverage. Kasi part of that, always takers and treated compliers would have insurance through uh, Senior Citizens Act. Uh, the increase um, uh, in health expenditures and in health facility use may be due to the combined effect of insurance coverage and adverse selection. So, uh, pwedeng dahil sa insurance coverage, pwedeng adverse selection. Hindi natin ma-rule out na niya tama sabi, ma pinpoint ta adverse selection siya. Pero yung yung last next na slide, yung never takers and the compliers, eto mga taong to, wala sila insurance coverage. But what we see is that uh, they they are likely to have uh, longer, uh, more likely to have hospital stay in the last year, uh, which may be an indication of adverse selection in the insurance coverage. <coughs> so meron meron ganong issue sa ating field health uh, that is highlighted uh, with the use of uh, the Expanded Senior Citizens Act um, as a natural experiment. Next slide, please. So yung last na tanong, how did insurance coverage affect um, medical expenditures and utilization? Yung gusto natin sana, uh, when you have insurance coverage, mas mababa na yung out-of-pocket mo, di ba? Kasi makukover na no field health uh, yung expenditures natin. Ang gusto natin, dahil meron ka insurance coverage, yung mga tao, they are more likely to go uh, visit a hospital if needed or to have their health checks at least once a year. Next slide, please. So, ganito yung idea ng ginawa namin. Uh, the idea is the same uh, nung kanilang graph na pinakita ko, na before the Senior Citizens Act Amendment in 2014, dapat wala tayong makitang break uh, dun sa expenditures or kung anumang outcome yung titignan natin uh, at age 60. Kasi ibig sabihin na ito, wala, wala pang ibang ano, wala pang ibang mechanism that would uh, that would justify such break kasi wala namang program at that time that pertains to health insurance. Pero after 2014, we expect, uh, sana meron. Uh, and that would signify, that, that would give you an estimate of the impact of the Senior Citizens Act uh, on field health coverage and eventually on, on these outcomes, in this case, uh, medical expenditures. Uh, yung estimate na, map, na papakita ko sa inyo, these are for compliers. So ito yung impact dun sa mga tao na nagkaroon ng insurance dahil sa Senior Citizens Act uh, expansion in 2014. Next slide, please. So these are the results. Uh, ang hahanapin nyo dyan sa taas, uh, yung ano ba yung outcome? So log health expenditure, health expenditure share, outpatient expenditure, inpatient expenditure, medical exp- product expenditures, yung bandwidth na 5 or 10, these are just uh, age groups. Uh, ilang ilang age, anong mga, anong age group yung sinama namin sa estimation? So pag 5, this would be from age uh, 56 to 59, and then from 60 to 64. Eh, pag 10, so ganun lang, 10 to the left and the right, dun sa ating uh, 60 years old na cutoff. So pag may star, Ibig sabihin yung statistically significant, tapos kung uh, hindi na ako masyadong particular dun sa number, but I would just say na positive or negative yung impact. So, field health, what, based on this table, what we found is that field health coverage increased out-of-pocket health expenditures among elderly compliers uh, due to increased expenditures for outpatient care. So, and medical products that are not normally covered by field health. So, alam naman natin na yung outpatient na, na side ng field health is medyo hindi siya well-developed as the inpatient care. But what we found here is that uh, although wala siyang impact dun sa inpatient care, uh, it's not statistically significant, 
Pero yung outpatient care, tumaas siya dahil tumaas yung expenditures for for medical products and for medicines. Now, these are not the, the, the services and products that are not usually covered uh, by PhilHealth. Next slide, please. So, sa healthcare utilization naman, uh, we found uh, some evidence of increased healthcare utilization, particularly, particularly for hospitalization. Medyo thin na yung sample natin dito, increase natin into to five, 15 years. So, medyo umabot pa siya, although the impact is quite huge at 20, uh, additional 20 percentage points relative to the average 17 percent na before uh, Senior Citizens Act. So, tumaas yung, yung probability na magstay yung isang uh, senior citizens sa, sa hospital because of the expanded senior citizens act. Next slide, please. So, sabi natin kanina when when I was starting the present presentation, uh, ang usual goal natin is to have uh, is to lower out of uh, pocket expenditures. But here we found na actually yung field health yung ESCA increased. OP expenditures, and this is due to uh, increased yung expenditures, and this is unexpected and maybe disconcerting uh, to some. So we want to tease out, bakit ba tumaas yung out-of-pocket expenditures dahil sa field health coverage? Next slide, please. So, ano yung posibleng mechanism? So, one thing that we're uh, thinking was that baka yung mga matatanda uh, when they, when they are almost uh, sixty years old, they withhold going to to uh, going to health facilities, uh, seeking health care. Kasi pagdating nila ng sixty, magkakaroon na sila ng health insurance. But when we look at the data, this that explanation uh, is not consistent with the data. Kasi no 2014, we found that uh, between 2014 and 2016, we found that there's lower health expenditures across all age groups uh, from 2014 to 2016. And yung uh, pinakamalaking bagsak was actually in their late 50s. Kung ikaw maghihintay ka ng healthcare, siguro baka paghihintay ka ng isa dalawang taon for your health insurance. Pero yung five years, parang medyo masyadong malayo na yun para isipin na magkakaroon ako ng health insurance when I turn 60, so hindi mo na ako magpapakit sa doktor ngayong 55 ako. So, uh, hindi, hindi, siguro hindi ito yung rason. So, next slide, please. Uh, another mechanism that we're looking at is that Maybe yung mga yung increased utilization actually leads to greater point of care enrollment in field health. So as sabi natin kanina, yung field health uh, field health coverage resulted to greater out of pocket expenditures. Ang sinasabi rito, baka pag pumunta ako sa hospital, mas malaki yung mas malaki at nalaman kung pwede ako mag-enroll sa health sa field health, dun magpapa-enroll ako. So ang um, makikita ko sa data yung mga nag-enroll kasi pumunta sa hospital. Uh, and when we look at the data, this is also unlikely kasi yung point of care enrollment uh, of PhilHealth remains a small program of our social health insurance. So even with the unlikely chance that all point of care enrollees are senior citizens, uh, this constitute only about 1% of all senior citizens covered by PhilHealth. So, so maliit lang siya. And even we, if we take that into account in our estimates, maliit lang yung magiging uh, change do sa point estimate natin on the impact on out-of-pocket expenditures. So baka hindi ito yung mechanism. And plus, yung senior citizens, uh, they are more likely to enroll when they get their senior citizens card because they can, you can also get their PhilHealth coverage, your, your PhilHealth membership, uh, kasabay na. Uh, isang office na lang sila. Okay, so baka hindi ito yung hinahatatin na, ano, na mechanism kung bakit, ng, bakit tumas yung out-of-pocket expenditures because of field health coverage. Next slide, please. Yung last na may natinignan is maybe because uh, tumas naman talaga yung ano, nag nagpakita sa doktor. And we look at uh, yung diagnosis. These, these are ano, uh, stated diagnosis ng mga, ng mga tao ng sa demographic ng health survey. So what we found was that uh, those who are age 6 and older uh, in 2017, mas mataas yung nagsabi na uh, meron silang chronic condition, mas mataas yung nagsabi na meron silang hypertension. And uh, historically, we know that uh, chronic disease diagnosis is low due to severe underdiagnosis. So for instance, in our data dun sa demographic and health survey, we found that hypertension, ang sabi nila, 5% uh, lang sa kanila yung meron hypertension. 
uh, but estimates uh, uh, from the DOST, uh, what we found was that about 35 to 40% of prevalence in the Philippines. So severely underdiagnosed the chronic disease in the Philippines. And maybe kaya tumaas yung out of pocket expenditures uh, because because now they have feel health, they have increased contact with the healthcare system. Uh, mas malaki yung chance na madiagnose sila ng tama. And because the diagnosis nila ng tama, yung out of pocket nila, out of pocket expenditures nila are actually complementary services ng pagdiagnose nila. So yung outpatient care, medicines, and these uh, these services, these clues are largely not covered by field health. Kasi for the most part, a field, uh, in patient care, yung well-developed uh, component ng ating national health insurance program. Next slide, please. So, so we were talking about uh, compliers, yung mga na-induce uh, na magkaroon ng health insurance because of the Senior Citizens Act. So, can we say something about the always takers and never takers? And actually, we do, uh, based on a, next slide please, on a new technique uh, uh, that was published in 2017, uh, which we use in our paper. So, although, kumakita nyo, these are the impact on total out-of-pocket expenditures. Uh, so we have always takers, compliers, never takers, IV. This, this, this is the estimate that I showed you earlier. Uh, naman sila magkakapareho when you test it. Na, uh, we cannot say na magkakaiba yung impact sa always takers, compliers, and never takers. But if you focus on the point estimates uh, na sila lang, we can see na mas malaki yung impact ng total ng... Uh, Feel of feel of coverage and never takers at medyo mas malit lang sa always takers, which we would expect since you never takers would have uh, no insurance uh, and sila yung more likely na benefit uh, from having uh, insurance coverage. Next slide, please. So balik ako sa key takeaways ng study and this is uh, just to summarize the result, the the rest, the presentation. First, we found that the Expanded Senior Citizens Act increased social health insurance coverage by 10 to 20 percentage points, which is a good thing. And we found that compliers tend to be middle class, female, and in some dimensions, high utilizers. So middle class and female, this is a good thing because they are covered usually in field health uh, in the, during their prime age. But yung adverse selection uh, part a major, major, ano tayo dyan? Major may issue tayo dyan. Uh, and finally, uh, last two slides, yung uh, last two bullets, contrary to expectations, yung out of pocket mental expenditures increased by over 100%, driven by non covered expenditure categories. And as I've shown earlier, that is, this, uh, this is uh, consistent with outward shift in medical care demand. Mas lumaki yung demand ng mga tao uh, for health insurance, for, for health services because of field health coverage. And last slide, please, uh, implications for policy. So, We've seen an increase in insurance coverage, and uh, insurance. We see here that the increase in insurance coverage can lead to increase in out-of-pocket expenditures that may be contrary to policy uh, uh, intentions. But uh, I can say that this is not necessarily counterproductive, since this may be the result of increased contact with health system, leading to better diagnosis, which may be overall welfare improving, or with complementarities with non-covered services, which suggests that elderly are willing to pay for, uh, pay it for themselves. Uh, important dito that we need to ensure that increased expenditures reflect the use of necessary care. Na kaya lang sila nasa hospital kasi kailangan nila yun. At, uh, and this is, uh, this is something that they need actually uh, for their health. And that healthcare providers are not charging higher prices uh, to insure patients na dahil alam nila na meron silang feel that they are more likely to use their uh, healthcare services na hindi nila i-jack up yung prices or that they will not pass this cost to other patient groups. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abrigo, for that insightful for, uh, insightful presentation. So, friends, to react to the presentation is Dr. Gilberto de Guzman, head of the PhilHealth Customer Assistance Relations and Empowerment Staff Project, or PhilHealth Cares. Dr. de Guzman is under the supervision of the PhilHealth Office of the Senior Vice President's Health Finance Policy Sector. Dr. de Guzman, you may proceed. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Ashila. Thank you for the introductions. So on behalf of PhilHealth, I'd like to thank the Philippine Institute for Development Studies 
President Edicito, Ediceto or Beta. And of course, I'd like to commend uh, the team of Dr. <clears throat> Michael Abrigo for the well, well, very comprehensive study. So just for your information, Dr. Abrigo, I intentionally did not read your presentation while I'm reading the research. So I will come up with uh, my own uh, takeaway, takeaways. And apparently it's kind of similar. So it goes to show that the highlight mo talaga yung key results and yung study uh, in your discussion paper. So I would like to congratulate you for that. Um, next slide, please. So to start with the key points, uh, uh, number one key points, well, of course, as echo as reiterated by Dr. Abrigo is the substantial jump in the insurance coverage at age 60 after the implementation of the expanded Senior Citizen Act. So according to the APIS, it's 26% in 2014, and it jumped to 46% in 2016. While in uh, the Demographic Health Survey, it, saw, it, it showed that the 61% is the coverage in 2013, and it's 83% in uh, 2017, and majority of which is from the coming from the middle class. And that struck me because apparently because of the for the low socioeconomic status, they may be also member already of the sponsored group or the NHTS. While for those who are in the higher socioeconomic status, they may be already part of the uh, the other groups, particularly from the employed sector or the self-employed. So next slide. So just to corroborate the result of the study, so the fill out stats and charts are available in our website. So in 2013, that's that's before the implementation of the program, we could see uh, the second column sh uh, shows the number of enrolled Filipinos over the total number of population, the percentage. So it's at 79%, and we have the lifetime members at 1.32 million. But in 2014, when we implemented, uh, when the law was implemented, uh, the lifetime members is at steady at 1.6 million, but the senior citizen is at 4.3 million already. So we now have the data of the senior citizen. I think in the chat, there was a question, uh, senior citizen a premium? Technically, it comes from the, the funding will be coming from the sin tax, uh, as, as stipulated in the law. At the same time, we are actually billing the DBM for the annual premium through the, the Department of Health. So we need bill for the DBM. So in the succeeding years, you can see already the increase in the cover in the number of enrolled uh, primary members as well as dependents. So at 7.12 million in 2015 to as high as 8.47 million in uh, 2017. And accordingly, summing enrolled population, percentage of enrolled population in 2017, NASA 93% na ang aming coverage. So next slide. So for the next two takeaway, I think that it answers the question, so what? So I think we now we know based on the study that the increase naman talaga yung coverage because it's already, it's already free. So the, the government is already paying for it. So one key point is uh, whether those who are more likely to select into the insurance or what uh, the researcher called the compliers had higher hospitalization prior to being eligible for uh, field health or what, what we call the adverse selection. I think it's kind of tricky no, to make an assumption on this one because there'll be a lot of factors. But I do agree with what uh, Dr. Abrigo said earlier that it could be that because we create a demand. So when you advocate for something, you create a demand, there's a supply. And of course, people will actually access the services. And we all know that the senior citizen, most of them are really the one, uh, they have a lot of comorbidities and they're actually getting the health services more often than the younger generation. So next slide, please. So just to show to you our top medical cases in uh, in 2021 upon us. So So nakita ko dito, I will highlight the mga diseases na kind of related sa ating mga senior citizen. We have number two, we have the hypertensive emergency or urgency. So top two siya in terms of the number of claims paid. We also have the stroke infarction. So number eight siya sa top number of claims paid by PhilHealth. And of course, we have pneumonia at number one. So even if hindi naman siya synonymous sa old age, but the other healthy mga senior citizens, they are a considered immunocompromised na population. So they are a simple cough kung hindi na manage well, could lead to pneumonia. 
So, maari din ma-associate sa elderly. So, based dun nga po dun sa data ni Dr. Big, mataas nga ang claims na ano, ang um, hospitalization ng ating mga senior citizen. And it's being corroborated by our data. Uh, next slide. For the top procedures in 2021, we have the hemodialysis. I'm not saying all senior citizens are nagkakaroon po ng kidney failure, pero maraming uh, percentage compared sa younger generation in the dialysis. We have the um, cataract extraction. So mga senior citizen, sila din yung karamihan na nag-a-avail ng cataract extraction. So it's number eight. And the cancer treatments, like chemotherapy, uh, radiation, uh, those are also included in the top procedures. So it's just corroborating din po yung result ng study na mataas talaga yung hospitalization natin mga senior citizen. So ipag increase natin yung coverage, given na po, natataas din yung availment. One, that, that could be one of the effect. So next slide. And to update everyone under the Universal Health Care Act, uh, na simplify na yung ating health membership, na doon pa rin man yung mga subcategories, but nagkaroon ng two main categories. We have the direct contributors, under that is the formal economy. So kasama na po doon ang ating government and the uh, private sector. The informal economy, the self-employed, and the lifetime members. Yung isang group is doon papasok ang ating senior citizen, the indigents, and the sponsored program. When nung binabalangkas pa po yung batas, naging malaking debate yan. Initially, it's called non-paying and paying. But as they say, hindi naman talaga non-paying yung mga indigent senior citizen and sponsored. And I think we have a guest from BBM. They know that someone is paying for them. So we, uh, the law eventually called them the indirect contributors. Uh, next slide. In terms of the claims payment based on the category, so puntahan lang natin, I think more, uh, mas mataas pa rin man natin mga direct contributors. But if you look at the pie, you can see that 17% of the total number of claims is by the senior citizen. Some of the lifetime members at 5%, so that's 22%. And more or less, meron pang mga senior citizen na nakapaikot dun sa sponsored, sa government, sa private, for example, doctors. There are some doctors na kahit senior citizen na very active pa rin sila. So, nag-gain to the employee pa rin and those mga may, may businesses. So, mas mataas pa rin talaga ang ating, uh, in terms of the number of claims sa ating mga senior citizen. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, another, the last key points is an uh, increase in insurance coverage leads to increase in out-of-pocket uh, expenses. Again, um, if you may, I may, I think very tricky din po na sabihin natin it's like a chicken and egg kasi there may be a different factors bakit mataas yung out-of-pocket expenses. Later on, I will discuss on the perspective ng PhilHealth. Next slide. So ito po yung aming uh, commission na 2017 PhilHealth Support Value Survey conducted by Dr. Hilton Lam in coordination with the Institute of Health Policy and Development Studies and the National Institute of Health uh, UP in Manila. And then I go, let's go focus on the support column for the adjusted support value with other, without other support, the national support value field is only at 52.99%. Ibig sabihin, pag na-hospital, the rest is tinocover ng pasyente. Maswerte kung merong HMO yung pasyente natin or may other insurance siya na available. Otherwise, it's considered out-of-pocket ng pasyente, yung 52.99. And from all the group of the member categories there, you could see that uh, the lifetime members and the senior citizens have the lowest support value at 47.66% uh, for the senior citizen and the lifetime 42%. So, ano ba yung possible explanation? You must admit that current the payment mechanism po ni PhilHealth for the inpatient is uh, through case rate. Uh, ibig sabihin po ng case rate, ibig sabihin fixed. So, they, for example, for pneumonia, alaming coverage for pneumonia is uh, 32,000 for severe pneumonia. So pag na-admit si, huwag naman natin sabihin, na-admit si Dr. Mike Abdigo, bata pa siya, over sa isang marapit na mangretay na employee ng PID, so din na siya huwag mention ng name, so pareho lang po yung bayad, 32,000 pa rin. So, it goes, so most probably ang ating mga senior citizen, we expect because marami siyang comorbidities, so we expect that higher length of stay and maaring may other co-management, baka Simple pneumonia lang nung na-admit yung ating senior citizen, biglang nag-shoot up ang kanyang hypertension or meron pala siyang diabetes. So, ang daming management. 
and payment detailer is only a fixed case rate. So it, to that would explain a higher out of pocket for the senior citizen. Not lang sigo sa senior citizen, but or for other conditions na mas relatively mas maraming complications. But of course, the senior citizen, sila po yung pinaka sabi natin um, nasa immunocompromised state. So you expect na higher yung resources for the nagakailangan. Next slide. For the unadjusted support value by age, so kung punta na natin yung second table, may kita nyo dyan as they, uh, for the patient age group from 0 to 10, that's a 72% ang support value ni PhilHealth. Pero habang tumatanda, mababa siya, no? So as above 80, 52.17% na lang. So I think yung sinabi ko kanina, maring isa yun sa factor because of how we pay. Because uh, we pay through um, case rate. Next slide. So, nasan ba papunta si PhilHealth? I think the, the, the study presented different recommendation na increase yung coverage natin sa mga senior citizen. And yung so what nga na question eh, ano ngayon kung tumaas yung coverage? Tumaas ba yung uh, quality of service na nabibigay sa ating, sa ating senior citizen? Uh, mas maganda ba yung health outcomes nila? So, I think isa sa mga uh, magpupush for those reforms is the Universal Healthcare Act wherein we are ensuring, we want to ensure that all Filipinos are guaranteed equitable access, meaning lahat is maka access regardless of your social economic status or in life, the, to quality and affordable healthcare goods and services and protected against financial risks. I think under the uh, SDG Goals 3.8, nakalagay po din yung dalawa na measure for the universal healthcare. One is the proportion of the population na nakaka-access ng ng uh, I think quality na essential health services as well as access dun sa financial risk protection. So ito po yung pinaka goal ng Universal Healthcare Act. Next slide. And somehow dun sa study na touch po yung different uh, yung framework ng cube ng ating Universal Healthcare, the population coverage, service coverage, and financial coverage. Uh, sa population coverage, isa sa uh, Minamandate ng batas is automatic inclusion of every Filipino citizen of the National Health Insurance uh, Program. So lahat, very all Filipinos, member ka na. So sa service uh, coverage, immediate eligibility and access to population-based and individual health services. Population-based, ito po yung mostly financed by the Department of Health, meaning for the whole population, like lifestyle modification, health promotion, while for individual health services, yun po yung kay Mostly kayo feel help po yun. Natatrace sa isang individual. I-highlight ko lang immediate eligibility. According to the law, no one should be deprived because of the payment. So meaning, dati natatandaan nyo po, meron 3 out of 6, 6 out of 9. So pag na-admit yung pasyente, uh, ay ano ka pa, denied ka, no qualifying contribution kasi kaka-member mo lang last month. So that's adverse selection nga kasi. So magkapabayad ka lang because magbabayad ka lang kasi magpa-opera ka next month or mga nganak kasi ako in uma o da buntis ako ay papa na ako papa papa member na po ako so those things so with the new law that will be immediate eligibility I think that will be a good study for kids no ano kaya yung impact ng immediate eligibility sa payment ni feel help kasi ngayon may mga Facebook group na kana ikitan di na ako magbabayad kasi immediate eligibility naman so that's one of the challenges now na tinefaced ni feel help how to collect parin Yung na wala nang madidipan-deny na claims. And of course, the financial coverage, the reduction of out-of-pocket expenses. Next slide. I highlight ko lang, there are a lot of reforms po dun sa ating, um, uh, sa Universal Healthcare Act. One is the, to address yung support value ni uh, out-of-pocket is you have the no co-payment. In the law, it says there, no, uh, no co-payment for basic or ward accommodations. So meaning, pag na-admit si, uh, si Ma'am Sheila sa hospital, pumunta siya ng ward ng, let's say, ng RMC, so libre na siya, regardless kung ang income ni Ma'am Sheila ay 1 million per month. Kasi nakalagay sa badas, sa nasa ward siya, libre siya. At the same time, of course, yung ating indigent, libre pa rin siya. So wala na out of pocket. And, and sinasabi din po doon na ang ating mga government hospitals, 90% dapat may ward accommodations. While for the private, at least 10% lang naman ang kanilang na-require sa kanila. But for the specialty hospitals like NKTI, uh, Lung Center, tignan yung mga sabi nga yung mga damang loob sa East Avenue, Heart Center, lahat yan, 70% dapat yan ay ward accommodation. And for that, 
regardless ng inyong type of uh, membership, libre ka. So, wala siyang lalabas. So, however, what if naman gusto mo naman mag-other amenities? Gusto mo mag-private, mag-semi-private, gusto mo mag- uh, gusto mo may special amenities other than sa ward accommodation. We have also been being mandated by the law to come up with a co-payment and co-insurance policy. Like a like a co-sharing po. So it's a flat fee or, the ter- or a predetermined rate paid at the point of service percentage of a medical charge that is paid by the insured with the rest paid by the health insurance plan. Meaning, in current the case rate po namin ni the field, for example, uh, in 32,000 namin for pneumonia, for government hospitals, meron kaping no balance billing policy na existing. Meaning, kung kasama ka sa indigent, so dapat wala nang sisingilin sa'yo. However, kung private ka, pumunta ka ng private hospital, admittedly, ngayon po, no, sinasabi na namin, wala, right now, wala po kaming uh, limit, doon sa regular na case rate po namin, wala kaming limit for the out-of-pocket. Out of, out of so maganda kung yung hospital ay hindi na sila maniningil, option nila yun. However, after the case rate, pwede po sila maniningil on top. And I think that will be a, a big, currently a big issue with us kasi sinasabi na, sabi nga ni, sa study, middle class daw yung isa sa mga compliers. Isa sa mga nagko-complain sa PhilHealth, bakit daw masyadong puno na lang mga indigent yung programa namin? Paano man yung middle class? Pagpupunta kami ng government, ma-accommodate ba kami ng government? So dapat malimit din pag pumunta, pag gusto ko pumunta ng private hospital, then I should be uh, protected din naman. So kasama po yun sa study ni PhilHealth is yung co-payment and co-insurance. Of course, the uh, benefits implement the complementation. So ito po yung complementation and different financing schemes like the HMOs and PhilHealth dapat may pag-uusap kung paano siya maayos yung, um, paano yung deduction. So if I may add lang po just as ending, so yung siguro sa mga dapat na-emphasize na changes ni PhilHealth, we have the DRG, uh, diagnosis-related grouping. It's also a case-based po na payment. Ito na po yung shifting ni PhilHealth as mandated by the law. Meaning, di na kami, although case-based siya, mayroon na pong uh, consideration ng unique complexity sa isang pasyente. For example, if you have comorbidities, may additional po na dagdag sa payad ni Bill Health. As well as kung ang cases, for example, yun nga, ko nga, yung example ko si Dr. Arbrigo ay na-admit for pneumonia, most probably mas mababa yung bibigyan namin na case rate as compared to sa may isang senior citizen na na na-admit Kasi most probably, mas mataas yung leg of stay niya. As well as for slope naman, as kung na-admit ka for acute tonsilloparyngitis, kung meron based dun sa costing namin, nakita naman natin, of course, ang ATP, hindi mo, hindi mo siya pwede i-compare sa slope patient. So we expect din po, kasama po yan sa uh, changes. And I believe PIDS po yung isang na-award and for to conduct the research, yung pagtulong sa PILA to come up with the DRG na case tariff rate, na, which will be very essential to sa reforms and reducing the out-of-pocket. And I think we have guests from the hospital, the Mariana Marcos, and from the San Juan Medical Society, yung clamor na unfair naman na isang case na, na pare-pareho lang yung payment sa isang particular uh, pay, uh, cases. So yun po yung sinasabi na rin the clamor for a more responsive and appropriate benefit kasi for PhilHealth, paano kami mag-demand na huwag kayo maninggil ng sobra kung yung payment naman namin is hindi naman... Uh, uh, commensurate. And last po siguro is yung emphasis for the primary health care. As gatekeeping, isang po yan sa inaan, emphasize ng uh, universal health care. Sabi ni Dr. Abrigo na, na baka mamaya pa-admit na naman pa-admit kasi libre. So I think with the law, sinasabi din na mas strengthen yung primary care na bago pumunta dapat may mag-aalaga na primary health care position or provider sa'yo para din ma-minimize din yung uh, adverse selection na lahat na lang pa-admit ng pa-admit. In fact, can be managed naman as an outpatient. With that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. De Guzman, for corroborating the findings of uh, Dr. Abriga and also for um, explaining to us uh, how PhilHealth uh, provides its uh, services. Okay, so friends, we have heard the presentations of our resource persons and the insights of our discussions, and this time we would like to hear from you. So we have come to the next part of our webinar, which is the open forum. But before that, uh, I'd like to inform you that we won't have a call uh, this afternoon, but we will have a raffle wherein we will randomly uh, uh, select two names from Zoom and two names from Facebook. Okay, and each of them will receive a prize and I will announce the winners of our raffle before we close the webinar. So at this point, I invite all our speakers, uh, Dr. Briones, Dr. Abrigo, 
Engineer uh, Sulaik and uh, Dr. Uh, De Guzman to the open forum. Okay, so let me check our uh, our Q and A box. I uh, I noticed that um, there are already um, a number or several questions that have been answered by our friends from from uh, Nia. However, let me um, ask. Uh, let me pick some of the questions that have already been answered so we can also um, get the inputs of our other discussants or for other uh, speakers. And let me start with the uh, question of, um, okay, there's a uh, good question here regarding our, um, the devolution, okay? The, dev um, the devolution of functions to the LGUs and this pertains to the communal irrigation systems, okay? Levina Grana, uh, said a uh, communal irrigation system is part of the devolved functions of the LGU based on the devolution transition plan. What would, what would be your takeaways to both NIA and LGU for irrigation services to be enhanced and sustained? And I think uh, Dr. Bruce Tolentino has also a question uh, related to uh, the communal irrigation system. Um, there There's already an answer for Answer from Mia, and may I just read this with the upcoming devolution function, devolution of functions to LGUs. Mia crafted a devolution transition plan, which was already submitted to the DM based on ESDTP. The agency will provide capacity building activities to LGUs starting 2022 to strengthen capacity them for the management of the communal irrigation systems. But may I also ask um, Dr. Briones if uh, you'd like to answer this question based on uh, the findings of your study? Uh, yes, uh, I would, uh, Sheila. So, well, although, of course, uh, the book was written before the Mandana's ruling <laughs> was, was issued, uh, we did observe that there is a lack of resources and a lack of prioritization of local government units for the small irrigation systems that were placed under their mandate. So it's still mostly dependent on uh, investments coming from the national agency, the NIA. Now, there's some hope na baka magbago under, you know, the, the, the windfall no, of ERA, the ERA expansion. But I'm not actually very optimistic about this because if you look at the ERA formula, um, there's quarter for equal share and 50% for population and only around, I think, 25 or so percent uh, for for um, uh, 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 land area. And we know that these rice growing areas, they're kind of land intensive. Plus, you still have to contend with the sharing uh, at barangay level. So barangays mm -hmm. historically have not, they're actually not uh, mostly are not interested in uh, irrigation systems. Nor even provinces, medyo mataas na level na yan. So it really falls on cities and municipalities. Mm -hmm. But the cities are high population areas with usually shrinking rice growing areas. So given all of these considerations, I think the ERA formula is kind of too blunt. No? Mm -hmm. Na asahan natin na despite the windfall or the expansion of ERA, that it will cause a really serious dent. On, on, uh, on the changes. It's good to be hopeful, no? And perhaps I might be proven wrong uh, once we're actually operating under the new regime, uh, new level of era. But frankly, I'm not optimistic. So I think there's still a big scope for national agencies to at least support the irrigation development and do some kind of transition uh, with the local government units. Thank you very much, uh, Rubel, for your uh, candid remarks. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, in addition to uh, Dr. Uh, Briones, uh, uh, we have already a, a sort of consultation to the local government unit uh, on our feed offices, and there are already some feedback uh, coming from the from the regional offices of NIA that uh, there are some uh, local government unit are not. Uh, uh, hesitant to accept the, the transfer of the communal irrigation project to their side because of that uh, situation that uh, the capability of the LGU based on the resources is not yet uh, ready. Well, in fact, uh, the other day, 
we have our uh, consultation kumustahan mm-hmm. with the chairman of the committee of the devolution transition plan and i already made this information to them and uh, this will be going to to come up when we have a, a forum that we will going to schedule this coming uh, august uh, 23 uh, that's why uh, we are always uh, giving a feedback to the uh, chairman of this commission uh, devolution committee transition plan that's uh, that, that, that's one uh, information that uh, we give to to them because we have already an initial uh, coordination with the some LGU because uh, irrigation is uh, not like other uh, infra project that uh, it needs uh, other uh, uh, specialty like uh, uh, the the discipline for hydropower the discipline for uh, for the economics and there are plenty of uh, discipline that uh, we will going to consider in uh, implementing uh, irrigation project. Uh, Madam, uh, uh, that's uh, to add on to Dr. Bionis. Maraming salamat po, Engineer Sulai. Okay, let's uh, move to another um, irrigation-related question. And this one is from um, Mr. Jose Dado. Um, in, multi- in multi-purpose irrigation projects, such as those with hydropower component, how can the communities and LGUs benefit more from hosting such facilities than just the share from electric electricity sales provided by Energy Regulation 1-94 of the DOE. Um, Ruel, would you like to answer first? Uh, I saw on the screen that Nia is already typing uh, their answer, but you may want to answer this slide. Um, maybe we can, uh, if I may question the premise no? <laughs> of, of, the, of the comment or the query. No? Um, Perhaps if the community and the LGU can demonstrate that the hydropower project uh, inflicted some cost uh, mm-hmm. on the community. So, uh, say, it, previously they were entitled to more water resources, but now they were suddenly deprived because they have to share uh, through the facility. Or uh, perhaps an IP community uh, uh, got deprived of uh, some uh, important land because it got uh, taken over by the hydropower project. Although that is a different case, no? and there are rules and regulations under the IPRA, uh, Indigenous Peoples uh, Rights Act, uh, that, that will govern those other circumstances. Because in the end, no, those water resources, those are part of the national patrimony, right? So actually, the whole country has the right to benefit uh, from uh, or, or as a collective from those resources. So I don't really see the need to be so concerned about making sure that there's benefit unless the communities and LGUs can demonstrate that they were really somehow uh, extra sort, sort of extra harm by the presence of that project. Thank you very much, uh, Ruel. Um, Engineer Sulai, uh, would you like to respond to the question, sir? Yes, uh, uh, as per the APRA law, uh, the the host uh, LGU is in or, uh, we're only entitled uh, on the what you have uh, mentioned a while ago the e, e, uh, 194 that's the only the uh, legal basis that uh, the the LGU will have a share if there is a hydropower component of of uh, of those uh, irrigation project in their area. Thank you very much, Engineer Solai. Okay. I have um, um, a question for, for both of you, and this pertains to the um, an issue raised by Dr. Uh, Briones and his uh, co-authors regarding uh, coordination failure as one of the significant issues uh, in the sector. And I recall that years ago, the idea of um, creating a Department of Water uh, surfaced, and, and there was even a I think a consolidated bill that was approved in the House of Representatives. And the idea is that this department will oversee and coordinate all water-related programs and projects in the country. Um, However, it talks about this proposal has has died down. Do you think it is high time uh, that we revive this proposal, possibly in the 19th Congress? Uh, Roel, uh, Dr. Briones. 
Okay, so we um, we did advocate for better integration uh, of water governance, but it's not clear to me that another department concerning water will be part of the solution. So because again, uh, the, the department will be another co-equal uh, with, with the other departments, the DNR, the DA and so on, no? So, I, 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 can, I can see the rationale behind that because if you just go the way of uh, coordination councils, that also has a storied history in, in Philippine government, no? And that doesn't really also seem to work. Uh, Kayana, there was a hope that placing it under the CABSEC uh, would try to address some of these cross-cutting, cross-sectoral, cross-agency issues. Unfortunately, now one of the first acts is the abolition of the office of the CABSEC. Uh, if, if there could be some kind of uh, interagency coordination body that could be uh, imagined that will be able to take over some of the functions that were being done by the now abolished CABSEC, then I think that might be, uh, for now, no? Uh, what I can see might be better than creating another branch of uh, the bureaucracy under a separate department. Thank you, uh, Dr. Briones. Uh, Engineer Sulai, any thoughts? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chidlat. Uh, but in fact, uh, there is already a, a public consultation in creating the Department of Water uh, sponsored by Congressman Salceda. We attended that uh, consultation meeting and uh, based on the uh, discussion with the, with some other sectors of uh, uh, water user like of MWSS and the Lua, uh, during that that consultation, we are just an attached agency. If that happened, that there will be a Department of Water. So we will just uh, wait for whatever the outcome of this uh, creation of uh, one department that uh, will will will. Uh, uh, will uh, consolidate all the water users of the agency. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Engineer Sulaid. Now let's move to uh, uh, some questions related to the second presentation. And uh, this one is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, and, and Dr. Abrigo, uh, may, you may want to answer this. May, could you please expound more on your recommendation to ensure reasonable charge of decisions to newly insured patients? And what was your evidence that this really happens? And what policy would you recommend addressing this? Okay. So we're not saying that uh, physicians are charging more uh, than some of the insurance. Although there are documented cases here in the Philippines. There was a study in the 1990s by Dr. Solon. Uh, and we have a study in 2019 showing some differentiation in how uh, healthcare facilities uh, treat uh, patients when they have insurance coverage or not. And this is uh, in line with studies in other countries showing that uh, yung mga tao na may insurance usually uh, the health facilities they charge more because they know they can they can get uh, they can get away with it. Although I'm not saying that that happens in the Philippines. What we're saying in the study is that. Uh, because of this increased, uh, increased uh, uh, health facility use, health care use ng ating mga uh, elderly, we need to ensure that first, uh, that these services are actually needed. Na kailangan nila yung mga health care services na yun. Hindi sila pupunta doon para mag, ano ba, ano bang, yung, yung mga hindi naman nila kailangan. Kasi uh, there are naman documented cases, uh, in particular in Japan, uh, that the elderly there, for instance, go to healthcare facilities para makapagkwentuhan sa doktor. And this is a waste of time of our physicians. So hindi naman sana ganun, na pupunta lang sana doon uh, to chat with our doctors. But they have these uh, valid concerns, they have these uh, requirements for their health. And the second, uh, because of this increased demand uh, for healthcare services, and we know uh, from, from basic economic theory, na this could raise prices uh, because of this increased demand. Na, na what actually people are paying for are the actual services that they get. 
Now, they are not uh, being jacked up because there are more people who would require this. And because we know from economic theory na, na this one with allocating resources, uh, we're changing these prices. So, thank, you so thank you very much, Dr. Abrigo. We have another question, and it's also for you, uh, from Mr. Celso Villaduz of NEDA. We would like to clarify how the study came up with the findings that the expanded health insurance increases insurance coverage of 60 and older by 16 percentage points, considering that all senior citizens are automatically covered. Right? So, thank you so much for that question. So we need to uh, separate the idea of the jury and the fact of coverage. So the jury coverage, they said, all of us should have coverage. And that is required by law. But in fact, uh, itong mga tao nito, itong mga, they are ano, uh, eligible uh, for this uh, field health coverage, they, they might not know that they're covered. So you actual na alam na meron, at meron talaga silang membership uh, because they've registered with field health, is actually tumas lang talaga siya ng 10 to 20 percent, uh, uh, 16 percentage points yung point estimate, but yung range of the SMS is 10 to 20 percentage points. And part of that, uh, yung yung part of that, kasi meron silang ibang coverage, uh, even before the senior citizens uh, expansion, at yung iba, hindi nila alam na may coverage sila or hindi sila nakapag-register sa field. Kaya hindi sila na-record din sa data. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdiko. Now, we have a question for Dr. De Guzman. Uh, what agencies will shoulder the funds for field health insurance for indigent senior citizens in ESCA? I think you... Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I answered a while ago that uh, it's being billed to DBM. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Um, okay, we have other questions here. Uh, this one. Okay. How do you propose that fill health enrollment be increased among senior citizens? It would be interesting to see, for example, the role of LGUs in ensuring 100% registration. I think, yun nga po, as I mentioned earlier, ngayon po meron na tayong uh, immediate eligibility eh. So I think some of the updates and uh, I think what she was, uh, what the question is more relatable to sa dati. So mm -hmm. I think before kasi require, uh, I think the LGUs are also encouraged pa na enroll yung kanila mga senior citizen. However, kung sakaling ma-admit naman yung pasyente, they will just have to fill up a form and automatic makaka-avail naman even before, especially now with the immediate eligibility. So, hindi na talaga masyadong uh, issue mo. It's mostly just to identify kung sino yung ating mga senior citizen. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Di Guzman. Okay. So, uh, but but uh, my question is, do we have data showing that there was increased coverage and increased use of hospital facilities among indigent senior citizens because of the ESCA? Uh, Dr. Dr. Abrigo, Mike, do we have data showing that? Mm -hmm. That's actually the result of study that because these uh, people, uh, they become pagkagising nila, nila eligible na sila for field because of the ESCA, actually nag-increase yung kanilang uh, contact with the, with the healthcare system. So tumas yung hospital visit, yung hospitalization, tumas din yung facility visits, kaso nga ang, ang medyo flip side is tumas din yung out of pocket expenditures. And these are uh, indigent senior citizens? Uh, or we cannot really say, we cannot really say that so what we found was that itong mga compliers na to, that, that benefited from ESCA is actually mga babae. Oh, Kasi oh, hindi sige trabaho. Uh, usually, ano, uh, large proportion, uh, they are not eligible for lifetime membership kasi hindi naman sila trabaho uh, during their lifetime. Uh, tsaka yung mga middle class. Okay. Yung mga poor, they're covered uh, through other mechanisms. Through other mechanisms. Okay. Um, doc Dr. Di Guzman, would you like, would you have any input? Uh, yun nga po. I think I, I presented the data before na talaga ang mga senior citizen natin ang isa sa pinakamataas yung ating, uh, 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 ating claims count sa PhilHealth. As to kung indigent sila, yun nga, corroborating doon sa sari, mostly our middle class yung ating yes. senior citizen. So I think iba yung, iba yung naging context sa naman sa kanilang papa. Opo. Okay, so we have a, uh, a question again for uh, 
related to the uh, health to the health insurance study. Okay, so from uh, Mr. Uh, Andrew uh, Cesare Mando, and this is for you, Dr. Di Guzman. There are many citizens under 60 who are not covered by PhilHealth. They become covered only when they turn 60 due to the free coverage by ESCA. Do, do you think that this will continue and may even increase due to the in, due to increase in PhilHealth premiums? What do you think should be done about this? I think pang Miss Universe yung tanong po. Ano? <laughs> <laughs> so I think right now for your current, as I mentioned ko po yung immediate eligibility, even if you're not paying, pa na-admit ka, is uh, ano ka, makaka-avail ka man ng benefit. However, even the law also, pero protektahan din naman yung collection. So if you are financially capable po, you will be collected dun sa, I think that's one of the questions po eh, na sa chat din kanina is, uh, I collect yung missed contributions mo since napasa yung batas so November 2019. That is kung hindi ka po confidentially capable ka based sa assessment. However, kung itong less than 60 naman po ay uh, less than 60 naman po ay, finan ay financially incapable, pwede siya pumasok pa rin naman sa indigent program and masa-certify na hindi naman talaga siya, wala siyang pambayad for the years na hindi siya nagkabayad and then hindi siya sisingilin. As to paano ma-increase po yung enrollment, ang feel natin po constantly uh, may homecoming program to engage with different groups po, different sa association ng mga tricycle association, mga tricycle association from the employed sector to, uh, to encourage po na mag-member sa, sa PhilHealth. Ang mahirap po talaga ngayon is yung, yung mga voluntary, yung mga informal, for example, yung mga magtaho, Opo. mga kasi hindi naman talaga sila and ano din ba yung income na ipapadala ipapakita nila well, baka walang ITR pag pinakita sa amin sa PhilHealth so I think constant lang po yung communication namin is as of course immediate eligibility eligibility ka however responsibility responsibility mo din as a Filipino na magbayad ng premium kasi we also cover for the whole it's a social health insurance for after all thank you very much Dr. Di Guzman uh Another question for you. Marami talagang uh, question po sa, sa PhilHealth. And this one is uh, about um, um, the youth having uh, health insurance. Sabi ni Anonymous attendee again. Health insurance by private companies are quite uh, costly. And I wonder if PhilHealth is also considering campaigning to the youth, especially those in schools, for membership. Uh, this is when they are no longer felt health dependence of their parents, and yet not not all of them are employed. Thus, they have no field health coverage. So, uh, this is a comment. Maybe, he said maybe the health care for their senior years could, could already be prepared for an early age. I think naging, I think naging major issue yan recently because they require yata initially ni Dep and the dapat uh, insured ang ating mga sing ating mga kabataan. Pagdating ng 20, however, because of the K, uh, the implications siya ng K-12 eh. Kasi mm -hmm. before, pagdating ng 20, usually graduate na. Mm -hmm. Pagdating ng 20 ngayon, nasa second year college. At uh, medyo, medyo mas late na nag-graduate. So initially, ang naging uh, recommendation ni PhilHealth is, one is, uh, kung financially wala namang pambayad yung estudyante, they can go to the sponsored po. So basta merong assessment. And second po is, uh, nag-lobby na rin po kami sa Senate. I think last May, nagkaroon kami orientation with the Senate staff. Um, so sa mga recommendation namin is, of course, dahil sa K-12, may implication nga po eh, kasi nagdadagan mo ng two years. Ito pwede mapondohan ng gobyerno na yung mga, yun na ma-extend yung, yung sa shoulder ng government, yung premium, yung mga kabataan na hindi pa graduate, na wala pa naman talaga. So, madali naman po kasi kasi yung sinasabi nga namin, yung indirect contributors, hindi naman, yung non-pay, hindi naman po talaga libre technically. The government is paying for it. So, I think ang question is, yung saan mo yung budget na magagaling. As to yung sa mga schools, yes, may partnership po kami sa DepEd on sa, sa life, sa so social health insurance for PhilHealth. You may see, akin incorporate na rin po siya sa mga curriculum. Okay. I think just a good suggestion po yung financial literacy. It mm -hmm. could be a recommendation na ma-include din po sa sa curriculum ng DepEd po. 
Yes, sir. I agree with you. And another question again for you. You think um, this one is also from uh, Andrew Cesare Mando. Do you think PhilHealth should also include uh, in their health care programs prevention of diseases and not only cure, cure of diseases? Uh, uh, yes. Admittedly, po, most lang uh, mga cases in the past years I mostly more on cur uh, curative, so mostly inpatient. So with the new law din po, kasama na sa minamandate sa PhilHealth, is really mas comprehensive. Sabi nga, from womb to tomb. So dapat nasa baby yes. pa lang habang ano pa bago magkasakit, kasama po yun. And isa mm -hmm. sa minamandate sa amin is to come up with a benefit, comprehensive outpatient benefit package as well as uh, also that every Filipino must be registered of to a primary care provider of choice. So isa po yun. Na relatively sa PhilHealth may sa Philippines walang masyadong gatekeeping. So nangyayari mm -hmm. kung may pera ka, pupunta na ako sa specialist. Mm -hmm. Even if, if, if kaya naman ako i-manage doon sa baba. Probably because wala din naman kaming coverage talaga. And also isa din po doon sa change reforms ng batas is yung healthcare provider network. Ang ito po yung parang uh, it's a group of uh, providers from na composed sa primary level hanggang tertiary level. So meaning, ang mag-aalaga doon sa isang pasyente or isang pamilya is from from uh, bottom to top. So ibig sabihin, hindi siya pwedeng basa-basa pupunta doon sa taas kung hindi nakikita. So meron talaga ang gatekeeping para ma-manage din po yung resources. And very important po yung prevent. I agree po yung prevent, promote. Mas malaki yung magaga, matitipid mo kung mapiprevent mo na magkaroon sila ng comorbidities and then. Yung current po na package namin for, we have the field health consulta package. Okay. It's a transitory po na primary care package namin. We pay by capitation, meaning kung ilan yung nag-register na tao sa isang provider, then they get paid for it for a year. And then kasama po doon yung different na diagnostics as well as uh, maintenance meds kung nagkataon na meron na yung sakit yung pasyente. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Guzman, and we have a question for both you and uh, um, uh, Dr. Abrigo from Julius Dumangas. Have increased field health coverage and increased OO, uh, out of packet expenses contributed to bet better health outcomes for, uh, for senior citizens? I think uh, Dr. Abrigo has a caveat on this. Dr. Abrigo. Uh. Hirap ko ng tanong. <laughs> Hirap ng tanong, ano, kasi hindi. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually part of the story that, that I've been trying to build on social health insurance. Uh, this is not part of the presentation mm -hmm. na pinakita kanina. But uh, we've actually started working on this. Kasi mm -hmm. we started with the uh, impact sa... sa access to healthcare, so expenditures, then ano bang impact nun? Uh, bottom mm -hmm. line, better health ba yung mga senior citizens natin? And yung preliminary estimates namin actually was that, uh, ano siya, may malaki siya kung sa kasi negative yung effect. They are actually more likely to, based on the data that you've been analyzing, more likely, uh, mas mataas yung, uh, tawag dito, mortality rate actually. Mm -hmm. But I need to clarify, bakit kaya matumas yung mortality rate? And, and one of the things that we're thinking about uh, is that maybe it's because uh, these people are actually uh, part of the system na because of mm -hmm. that, uh, uh If you would, uh, PSA could, could, could corroborate this, um, yung ating kasing uh, vital statistics, uh, underreported siya. And this is happening around the world. Na hindi lahat ng namamatay pinapanganak na record. And mm -hmm. there has been a report na yung underreporting is as much as 50% in, in some locations in the, in the country. So, ang naisip namin, posible kaya na dahil senior citizen may feel health, mm -hmm. kumunta sa hospital, na record yung kamatayan niya. Posible kaya ang ganun. But, uh, dinidevelop pa namin yung study and hopefully uh, matapos namin yung study. And I would like to hear Phil Hens, uh, Dr. De Guzman's points uh, uh, on this. Well, I think that's good to hear po na meron kayong plans to do that. Admittedly, sa Phil Hens, uh, data isang po yan, sa data management, isa yan sa mga gusto na yung pagtuulan po. I think with, I, I recall dun sa isa sa mga infamous na Senate hearing na <laughs> uh, sinasabi na for pneumonia, sa data ni Phil Hens, ang taas sa as ng pneumonia. Pneumonia yung top claims namin. Pero okay. pati nilang kay DOH, Iba yung data nila. So it's either, may isa nagsisunan. <laughs> may, there, are, sabi nga, there are three sides. Either tama yung civil health, si DOH, or 
merong katotohanan na nakatagos because of the data na yung data na available. So I think with Phil Health sa titig na namin is kasama rin sa batas nakalagay na si Phil Health magiging pasyo ng national depository ng health data para isahan na lang sa para magagather din namin which is which will help us to come up with better policies and evidences pag gusto namin yung mag-increase ng benefit or mag-expand ng uh, coverage. And isa din sa gusto ng tutukan ni PhilHealth is currently yung mga kontrata namin sa ospital, parang para kami polis, parang sinasabi namin na hinuhuli namin kung may fraud. <laughs> yep. So I think one is that tinat- si pinupush din sa amin, tingnan din naman namin yung health outcome. Perhaps we can give incentives din sa mga providers sa maganda yung health outcomes. But after the question, I'm not, I cannot give you the data whether now kung ilan yung nag-improve na, okay. na senior citizen. But eventually, isa yan sa mga dream ni uh, Vision ni PhilHealth mm-hmm. na makita namin, for example, yung healthcare provider network, so na yun makita yung link ng primary care din sa taas. Mm-hmm. Kung bakit, sabi mo, inaalagaan mo yung mga pasyente mo sa RH mo or sa clinic, pero lahat ng pasyente na ito na-admit for hypertension. So we have to check kung at nag-improve ba talaga yung health outcomes ng ating mga members. Thank you very much, Dr. D. Guzman. And now, uh, let's go back to our irrigation study. And may, may I throw this question to uh, Engineer Sulai. And um, uh, this is from uh, Mr. Jose, uh, Mr. Jose uh, Dado. Okay, what is, he would like to uh, get clarification regarding the devolution transition plan for local irrigation systems. He asks, what is the devolution transition plan for local irrigation systems, particularly for LGUs without adequate resources to implement the CIS? And can lower income LGUs still propose local irrigation projects to NIA? Engineer Solai. Uh, yes, uh- for the devolution of the communal irrigation project to the local government unit, based on the Mandanas Garcia ruling of the Supreme Court, uh, what we have uh, already uh, instructed by the uh, devolution uh, transition plan is uh, for those first and fourth class municipality are the one to first to be devolved. But for the fifth and sixth class municipality, we are still hunting it sa amin pa rin siya. Kaya yung, yung, yung mga first to fourth class municipality, eh may medyo mataas na yung antas ng uh, LGU. That's why we, we going to, to take that as the first priority for this devolution. But for those, uh, siguro yung sinasabi niya na sa fifth and sixth class municipality yun, hindi yun siya masasama uh, dito sa devolution. We will still uh, going to, to cater all those uh, uh, under the fifth class municipality. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, sir. Uh, go ahead, po. Uh, yun yung aming uh, uh, ginagawa dito sa aming uh, devolution transition plan uh, with regards to the transfer of the communal irrigation project to the LTE. Okay. Julie noted, sir. Thank you, po. Uh, Engineer Sulai. Now, let us go to a question from uh, Mr. Daniel Agustin, and this is uh, specifically addressed to you, uh, Dr. Briones. He said, our irrigation system is rice-based, which is not our competitive ad- advantage. What should be done to irrigate the non-rice crops, which gives uh, better income to farm owners? Any thoughts, uh, Rowell? I'm sure engineer Sarah has also some thoughts about this, but just my initial uh, impression, yes. there, there is really need to uh, reorient the, the design of, of our systems. I say right now, uh, if, if, if the idea is rice, then it's mm-hmm. gravity and then it's flooded no? uh, during, mm-hmm. during uh, most of the uh, growing season. So there are other design considerations if there are other crops uh, that can be drawn. So. Uh, depends on the crops, no? vegetables have a certain need, coffee and other need, etc. So uh, there, there needs to be a, a, a much broader idea of what are the potentials of a particular uh, irrigation system. Especially uh, the farmers probably will need to discuss it together because it's kind of like a common common facility among them. No, uh, Maybe you turn out, one turnout can, can, can um, make their own decision, but... Uh, 
uh, even the, those within that turnout have to make an agreement no, on what is the appropriate uh, delivery system and even drainage system for the water. But uh, I would like to invite the uh, engineer uh, to also yes. give this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Roel. Um, engineer, please. Uh, yes, uh, well, well, in fact, in the National Irrigation Master Plan, uh, sa ngayon, we are now uh, catering the 3% slope of the for irrigation, but uh, based on the irrigation master plan, we are going now to 8 to 12% slope uh, so that uh, we can cater all the upland uh, land. Uh, pwede naman siya on the diversified, but in fact, we have already one project in Cebu that caters uh, cut flowers, no? Uh, ganun yung aming uh, nilalagay, where uh, there is a series of tank that we were going to to, in, to implement, uh, to install on the higher ground, and uh, then based on that, uh, by pumping, we can we can go it into gravity. That's why uh, we are now uh, uh, studying it as part of our uh, innovation in the, in the project implementation to consider the the eight percent uh, slope that uh, already uh, uh, having our proposal in the irrigation master. Thank you very much, Engineer Sulai. Uh, friends, we have uh, covered uh, the questions uh, in our uh, Q&A uh, box, Q&A section. Okay, so at this point, to cap our discussion, may I ask each uh, speaker for some uh, parting words, starting with Dr. Briones. So I think I've uh, covered uh, all that uh, I needed to say. I think I just need to reiterate that uh, we want to put, you know, an evidence, a solid evidence basis. So that's why in our study, we uh, tried to go for indicators and trying to, where the indicators were absent, we noted gaps and said that in future, we can plan for uh, trying to gather all of this data and evidence. It all, it's always best to be guided by this, and I'm sure uh, Nia and all the other agencies uh, are, are, um, are uh, also very sensitive and aware of this, and I hope we can also be able to distill the findings from these evidence-based, indicator-based assessments and communicate it to the wider public. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Briones. And now maybe hear from Engineer Sulai, sir. Uh, the, the, the big uh, challenge right now of the NIA, uh, the, uh, one is the, the devolution uh, transition plan for the communal irrigation project, where uh, there is a big challenge to us to how we were going to capacitate uh, the, our partner from the local government unit, because once this will be paid, there are uh, around uh, 9,000 communal irrigation system, around uh, 500,000 hectares, and this contribute a, a big uh, production in terms of palai. So that's uh, one uh, challenge that we are going to, to address. And another is to uh, the, the lack of technical capabilities of uh, our uh, organization as, as today as mentioned by uh, Dr. Bionis because of the uh, effect of the Ratlan uh, uh, in our organization during that time. That's why uh, we have now the ongoing reorganization process and or right sizing that we will going to adapt in our in our organization. And um, one another thing is uh, we have to to face also the the climate change that uh, we are now encountering in our uh, project implementation, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Bernes. These are a big challenge to us. That's uh, the the hard work that we will going to to going to to implement uh, in the future. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Engineer Solari. Now, maybe hear from Dr. Uh, Michael Abrito. Thank you so much, Angela. Well, I just want to emphasize, uh, based on the study, that uh, we have a lot of good programs uh, in government, and but many of these programs have uh, intend, uh, intended and unintended consequences, and it's important to identify these so that uh, moving forward, we'd be able to do uh, countermeasures uh, for these unintended consequences. A good thing that uh, in this case, uh, maganda naman yung, yung unintended consequence na even if tumas yung out-of-pocket expenditures, mga senior citizens as covered by uh, PhilHealth, this is because they have uh, greater contact with the health system. Thank you very much, uh, 
Dr. Abrigo. And of course, uh, may we hear from uh, Dr. De Guzman. Again, thank you very much to Pete for the, this initiative. We really welcome to get an external perspective on our programs. Parang hindi naman self-serving yung aming mga studies. So just probably as a parting uh, statement will be on the Universal Healthcare Act. I think when it was uh, crafted, uh, it, we are promising like the moon and the stars to our people. But in reality, universal healthcare is not free. And it will not happen overnight. Some countries, even the rich countries, took decades and even uh, pushing towards universal health care. But I think at the end of the day, uh, we need to, it's a whole of society approach and it's not, peer health may, may just be one piece of the puzzle, but it has to be a, a, a group work from the different uh, like groups for the, to achieve the universal health care. As they say, uh, no one should be left behind. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Di Guzman. So friends, please join me in thanking all our speakers for the insights that they have shared with us this afternoon. And also, um, thank you to all those who join in the discussion by uh, sending your, your comments and questions. Let's show our appreciation through a virtual clap. Okay? And friends, uh, here are the winners of our webinar raffle. Joseline Motita, Ralph Deo Ponce, and Anthony James Aldis. So our webinar team will get in touch with you for the delivery of your prize. And finally, we have some reminders. Okay, so you can access all the presentations from today's uh, uh, webinar on the PIDS website. Flash on the screen. Uh, the links to the uh, to the uh, studies, to the book of uh, Dr. Briones and his co-authors, and to the full study of uh, uh, Dr. Michael Abrigo. And we will also post on our website uh, the presentations of our discussions. Please also answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. Your comments are important to us to improve our virtual events. And friends, please regularly visit our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We also have a YouTube channel where you can access the recordings of our events. And flash on the screen is our final webinar for this month. So on July 28, we will tackle the Philippines' bottom-up approach to disaster risk reduction and management. And this is our humble contribution to the celebration of the National Disaster Resilience Month. And our resource persons for that webinar are Dr. Sunny Domingo and R.B. Choi Manihar. And finally, we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, academe, civil society, business, and international development community who joined us today. Um, the names of those uh, institutions are flashed on the screen. So this concludes our virtual policy forum for today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and see you next week. Maraming salamat po. <laughs>